Rich Dad's Cash Flow Quadrant, written by Robert T. Kiyosaki, with Sharon L. Lecter, CPA. Hello, my name is Robert Kiyosaki. I am the author of the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book series. Rich Dad, Poor Dad is a true story about my two dads, one my real dad and one my best friend's father. My real dad was a smart, highly educated man, at one time the head of education for the state of Hawaii. In my book, he was my poor dad because regardless of how much money he made, he was usually broke at the end of every month. My rich dad was my best friend's father. Although he started out his life without any money, he wound up being one of the richest men in the state of Hawaii. When you look at the white sand beaches, the blue ocean, the tall palm trees, the hula girls, and the tall hotels, rich dad owned the land under some of those hotels. The Rich Dad book and audio series reveals the lessons on money, careers, and business that my rich dad taught me, contrasted to the lessons my poor dad taught me. For many people, reading the simple stories gives them insights into the lessons about money they learned from their own parents, often saying such things as, I had a poor dad, or my dad sounded very much like your rich dad. This program, Rich Dad's Cash Flow Quadrant, is about a very important icon or diagram that my rich dad used to educate his son and me about money, investing, and choosing a career path in life. Rich Dad's Cash Flow Quadrant is about the four different people or cast of characters that make up the world of money, business, and investing. The Cash Flow Quadrant is about the differences between the E Quadrant, which stands for employee, the S Quadrant, which stands for self-employed or small business owner, the B Quadrant, which stands for business owner, and the I Quadrant, which stands for investor. Years ago, when I was just a boy, my highly educated dad, the man I call my poor dad, often said to me, Son, go to school, get good grades, so that you can get a safe, secure job with excellent benefits. My rich dad, on the other hand, said, If you follow your dad's advice, you will wind up in the E quadrant. It's okay to be in the E quadrant if what you really want in life is job security. But if you want to be rich, the E quadrant is the hardest quadrant to become rich in. The reason my rich dad said that was for many reasons, which are found in this book. The result of my rich dad's advice and the use of the cash flow quadrant changed my choice of career path and the direction I took once I was old enough to decide what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. As you may have guessed, I did not follow my poor dad's advice and look for job security in the E quadrant, nor did I go into the world of self-employment or small business, also known as the S quadrant. Instead, I used my rich dad's advice and the cash flow quadrant and chose to enter the B quadrant, the quadrant for business owners, and the I quadrant, the quadrant for investors. So who was Rich Dad's quadrant for? My answer is that is for anyone who is familiar with Rich Dad, Poor Dad and is now ready to make some changes in their life, changes that may require a change from one quadrant to another. As you listen to this program, you may soon discover that the four people in the four quadrants are four totally different people. As you listen to and read this book, you will find that the four people found in the four different quadrants are different mentally as well as emotionally. You will also find that it is the emotional differences that play a much more important role in determining which quadrant a person ultimately gravitates to. For example, a person who is in the E quadrant is often motivated by the need for security. A person found in the S quadrant is often motivated by the need for independence, wanting to do things on their own not relying on others. So this program goes into the differences between each of the four quadrants. As I said, it is for anyone looking for some kind of change in their life, either professionally or financially. This program does not imply that one quadrant is better than the other. It does, however, stress, as my rich dad stressed, that each of us should choose a quadrant or quadrants that best suit our own core values, personal beliefs, and future dreams. I use my rich dad's cash flow quadrant as a guide to find my own true self and the life's path that was best for me. This audio program has been created to serve as your guide to the future and your own personal self-discovery and to unlock what is important to you in your own life. Are you financially free? If you have come to a financial fork in the road and you want to take control of what you do today in order to change your financial destiny, Rich Dad's Cash Flow Quadrant will help you chart your course. Each of us resides in at least one of the four quadrants of the cash flow quadrant. Where we are is determined by where our cash comes from. Many of us rely on paychecks and are therefore employees, while others are self-employed. Employees and self-employed individuals reside on the left side of the cash flow quadrant. 
the right side of the cash flow quadrant, is for individuals who receive their cash from businesses they own or investments they own. Rich Dad's cash flow quadrant is about the four different types of people who make up the world of business, who they are, and what makes individuals in each quadrant unique. It will help you to find where you are in the quadrant today and help you chart a course for where you want to be in the future as you choose your own path to financial freedom. While financial freedom can be found in all four of the quadrants, the skills of a B, business owner, or an I, investor, will help you to reach your financial goals more quickly. A successful E, employee, should also become a successful I, investor. This program is the second in the Rich Dad, Poor Dad series. For those of you who may not have listened to Rich Dad, Poor Dad, it was about the different lessons my two dads taught me about the subject of money and life choices. One was my real dad, and the other my best friend's dad. One was highly educated, and the other a high school dropout. One was poor, and the other rich. Whenever I was asked the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? My highly educated but poor dad always recommended, go to school, get good grades, and then find a safe, secure job. Poor dad was recommending that I choose to become either a high-paid employee or a high-paid S, self-employed, such as a medical doctor, lawyer, or accountant. My poor dad was very concerned about a steady paycheck, benefits, and job security. My rich but uneducated dad, on the other hand, offered very different advice. He recommended, go to school, graduate, build businesses, and become a successful investor. This audio program is for people who are ready to change quadrants. It is for people who are ready to move beyond job security and begin to achieve financial security. It is not an easy life's path, but the prize at the end is worth the journey. It is the journey to financial freedom. Rich Dad told me a simple story when I was 12 years old that has guided me to great wealth and financial freedom. It was Rich Dad's way of explaining the difference between the left side of the cash flow quadrant, the E, employee, and S, self-employed quadrants, from the right side, or the B, business owner, and I, investor quadrants. It goes... Once upon a time, there was this quaint little village. It was a great place to live, except for one problem. The village had no water unless it rained. To solve this problem once and for all, the village elders decided to put out to bid the contract to have water delivered to the village on a daily basis. Two people volunteered to take on the task, and the elders awarded the contract to both of them. They felt that a little competition would keep prices low and ensure a backup supply of water. The first of the two people who won the contract, Ed immediately ran out, bought two galvanized steel buckets, and began running back and forth along the trail to the lake, which was a mile away. He immediately began making money as he labored morning to dusk, hauling water from the lake with his two buckets. He would empty them into the large concrete holding tank the village had built. Each morning, he had to get up before the rest of the village awoke to make sure there was enough water for the village when it wanted it. It was hard work, but he was very happy to be making money and for having one of the two exclusive contracts for this business. The second winning contractor, Bill, disappeared for a while. He was not seen for months, which made Ed very happy since he had no competition. Ed was making all the money. Instead of buying two buckets to compete with Ed, Bill had written a business plan, created a corporation, found four investors, employed a president to do the work, and returned six months later with a construction crew. Within a year, his team had built a large-volume stainless steel pipeline which connected the village to the lake. At the grand opening celebration... Bill announced that his water was cleaner than Ed's water. Bill knew that there had been complaints about dirt in Ed's water. Bill also announced that he could supply the village with water 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Ed could only deliver water on the weekdays. He did not work on weekends. Then Bill announced that he would charge 75% less than Ed did for the higher quality and more reliable source of water. The village cheered and ran immediately for the faucet at the end of Bill's pipeline. In order to compete... Ed immediately lowered his rates by 75%, bought two more buckets, added covers to his buckets, and began hauling four buckets each trip. In order to provide better service, he hired his two sons to give him a hand for the night shift and on weekends. When his boys went off to college, he said to them, Hurry back, because someday this business will belong to you. For some reason, after college, his two sons never returned. Eventually, Ed had employees and union problems. The union was demanding higher wages, better benefits, and wanted its members to only haul one bucket at a time. Bill, on the other hand, realized that if this village needed water, then other villages must need water too. 
He rewrote his business plan and went off to sell his high-speed, high-volume, low-cost, and clean water delivery system to villages throughout the world. He only makes a penny per bucket of water delivered, but he delivers billions of buckets of water every day. Regardless if he works or not, billions of people consume billions of buckets of water, and all that money pours into his bank account. Bill has developed a pipeline to deliver money to himself as well as water to the villages. Bill lived happily ever after, and Ed worked hard for the rest of his life and had financial problems forever after. The end. This story of Bill and Ed has guided me for years. It has assisted me in my life's decision-making process. I often ask myself, "Am I building a pipeline or hauling buckets? And am I working hard or am I working smart?" The answers to those questions have made me financially free. And financial freedom is what this program is about. I've divided this program into three sections. In the first part, I will explore the differences between people in the four quadrants. The next section is about personal change and identifies whom you have to be instead of what you have to do. The last section of this program will define the seven steps that you can take on your path to change. Along the way, I will share more of my rich dad secrets and help you choose your own path to financial freedom. Why don't you get a job? In 1985, my wife Kim and I were homeless. We were unemployed and had little money left from our savings. Our credit cards were exhausted, and we lived in an old brown Toyota with reclining seats that served as beds. At the end of one week, the harsh reality of who we were, what we were doing, and where we were headed began to sink in. Our homelessness lasted for another two weeks. A friend, when she realized our desperate financial situation, offered us a room in her basement. We lived there for nine months. When friends and family were informed of our plight, the first question was always, "Why don't you get a job?" At first, we attempted to explain, but in most instances, we failed to clarify our reasons. To someone who values a job, it is difficult to explain why you might not want a job. Occasionally, we did a few odd jobs and earned a few dollars here and there. But we did that only to keep food in our stomachs and gas in the car. I must admit that during moments of deep personal doubt, the idea of a safe, secure job with a paycheck was appealing. But because job security was not what we were looking for, we kept pushing on, living day to day, on the brink of the financial abyss. That year, 1985, was the worst of our lives, as well as one of the longest. Anyone who says that money isn't important obviously has not been without it for long. Kim and I fought and argued often. Fear, uncertainty, and hunger shortens the human emotional fuse, and often we fight with the person who loves us the most. Yet love held the two of us together, and our bond as a couple grew stronger because of the adversity. We knew where we were going; we just did not know if we would ever get there. We knew we could always find a safe, secure, high-paying job. Both of us were college graduates with good job skills and solid work ethics, but we were not going for job security. We were going for financial freedom. In 1989, we were millionaires. Although financially successful in some people's eyes, we still had not reached our dreams. By then, we never had to work again for the rest of our lives. Barring any unforeseen financial disaster, we were both financially free. Kim was 37, and I was 47. It doesn't take money to make money. I often hear people say it takes money to make money. I disagree. We had no money when we started, and we were in debt. It also does not take a good formal education. Many successful people have left school without receiving a college degree. People such as Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, Bill Gates, Ted Turner. So what does it take? My answer: It takes a dream, a lot of determination, a willingness to learn quickly, and the ability to use your God-given assets properly, and to know which sector of the cash flow quadrant to generate your income from. Which quadrant do you generate your income from? Rich Dad's cash flow quadrant represents the different methods by which income or money is generated. For example, an employee earns money by holding a job and working for someone else or a company. Self-employed people earn money working for themselves. A business owner owns a business that generates money, and investors earn money from their various investments. In other words, money generating more money. Different methods of income generation require different frames of mind, different technical skills, different educational paths, and different types of people. Different people are attracted to different quadrants. You can earn income in all four quadrants. 
Most of us have the potential to generate income from all four quadrants. Which quadrant you or I choose to earn our primary income from is not so much what we learned in school. It is more about who we are at the core, our core values, strengths, weaknesses, and interests. It is these core differences that attract us to or repel us from the four quadrants. For example, a medical doctor could choose to earn income as an employee and join the staff of a large hospital, or work for the government, the public health service, become a military doctor, or join the staff of an insurance company needing a doctor on its staff. The same doctor could also decide to earn income as an S, self-employed, and start a private practice, setting up an office, hiring staff, and building a private list of clients. Or the doctor could decide to become a B business owner and own a clinic or laboratory and have other doctors on staff. The doctor probably would hire a business manager to run the organization. In this case, the doctor would own the business but not have to work in it. The doctor could also decide to own a business that has nothing to do with the medical field while still practicing medicine somewhere else. In this case, the doctor would be earning income as both an E employee and as a B business owner. As an I investor, the doctor also could generate income from being an investor in someone else's business or in vehicles like the stock market, bond market, and real estate. The important words are generate income from. It is not so much what we do, but more how we generate income. More than anything, it is the internal differences of our core values, strengths, weaknesses, and interests that affect which quadrant we decide to generate our income from. Some people love being employees, while others hate it. Some people love owning companies but do not want to run them. Others love owning companies and also love running them. Certain people love investing, while others only see the risk of losing money. Most of us are a little of each of these characters. Being successful in the four quadrants often means redirecting some internal core values. Not all quadrants are equal. By knowing the different features of each quadrant. You'll have a better idea as to which quadrant or quadrants might be best for you. For example, one of the reasons I chose to work predominantly in the B business owner and I investor quadrants is because of tax advantages. For most people working on the left side of the quadrant, there are few legal tax breaks available. Yet legal tax breaks abound on the right side of the quadrant. By working to generate income in these quadrants, I could acquire money faster and keep that money working for me longer without losing large chunks to pay taxes. When people ask why Kim and I were homeless back in 1985, I tell them it was because of what my rich dad taught me about money. For me, money is important. Yet I did not want to spend my life working for it. That is why I did not want a job. If we were going to be responsible citizens, Kim and I wanted to have our money work for us rather than spend our lives physically working for money. That is why the cash flow quadrant is so important. It distinguishes between the different ways in which money is generated. There are ways of being responsible and creating money other than physically working for it. But in order to embrace wealth, it is essential to understand your relation to it. My highly educated dad had a strong belief that the love of money was evil. That to profit excessively meant you were greedy. He often said, "I'll never be rich," or "Investing is risky," or "Money isn't everything." My rich dad had a different point of view. He thought it foolish to spend your life working for money and pretend that money was not important. Rich dad believed that life was more important than money, but money was important for supporting life. He often said, "You only have so many hours a day, and you can only work so hard. So why work hard for money? Learn to have money." And people work hard for you, and you can be free to do the things that are important. To my rich dad, what was important was to have lots of time to raise his kids, to have money to donate to charities and projects he supported, to bring jobs and financial stability to the community, to have time and money to take care of his health, and to be able to travel the world with his family. Those things take money," said rich dad. "That is why money is important to me. Money is important." But I don't want to spend my life working for it. It was my rich dad who often referred to the cash flow quadrant when I was a young boy. He would explain to me the difference between someone who was successful on the left side versus the right side. Having two dynamic and successful father figures around me gave meaning to what each was saying. But it was what they were doing that allowed me to begin to notice the differences between the ES side of the quadrant and the BI side. 
One painful lesson I experienced as a young boy was simply how much time one dad had available to spend with me versus the other. As the success and prominence of both dads grew, it was obvious that one dad had less and less time to spend with his wife and four children. My real dad was always on the road, at meetings, or dashing off to the airport for more meetings. The more successful he got, the fewer dinners we had together as a family. Weekends he spent at home in his crowded little office, buried under paperwork. My rich dad, on the other hand, had more and more free time as his success grew. One of the reasons I learned so much about money, finance, business, and life was simply because my rich dad had more and more free time for his children and me. Although both dads made more and more money as they became successful, my real dad, the educated one, also got further into debt. So he'd work harder and suddenly find himself in a higher income tax bracket. His banker and accountant would then tell him to buy a bigger house for the so-called tax break. My dad would follow the advice and buy a bigger house, and soon he was working harder than ever so he could make more money to pay for the new house, taking him even further away from his family. My rich dad was different. He made more and more money but paid less in taxes. He too had bankers and accountants, but he was not getting the same advice my highly educated dad was getting. Yet the driving force that would not allow me to stay on the left side of the quadrant was what happened to my highly educated but poor dad at the peak of his career. In the early 1970s, I was already out of college and in Pensacola, Florida, going through pilot training for the Marine Corps, on my way to Vietnam. My educated dad was now the superintendent of education for the state of Hawaii and a member of the governor's staff. One evening, my dad phoned me in my room on base. Son, he said, I'm going to resign from my job and run for lieutenant governor of the state of Hawaii for the Republican Party. I gulped and then said, You're going to run for office against your boss? That's right, he replied. Why? I asked. Republicans do not have a chance in Hawaii. The Democratic Party and the labor unions are too strong. I know, son. I also know that we do not have a prayer of winning. Judge Samuel King will be the candidate for governor, and I will be his running mate. Why? I asked again. Why run against your boss if you know you're going to lose? because my conscience won't let me do anything else. The games these politicians are playing disturb me. Are you saying they're corrupt? I asked. I don't want to say that, said my real dad. He was an honest and moral man who rarely spoke badly about anyone. He was always a diplomat. Yet I could tell from his voice that he was angry and upset when he said, I'll just say that my conscience bothers me when I see what goes on behind the scenes. I could not live with myself if I turned a blind eye and did nothing. My job and paycheck are not as important as my conscience. After a long silence, I realized that my dad's mind was made up. Good luck, I said quietly. I'm proud of you for your courage, and I'm proud to be your son. My dad and the Republican ticket were crushed, as expected. The re-elected governor sent the word out that my dad was never to get a job again with the government for the state of Hawaii, and he never did. At the age of 54, my dad went looking for a job and I was on my way to Vietnam. At middle age, my dad went from jobs with big titles and low pay to more jobs with big titles and low pay. He was a tall, brilliant, and dynamic man who was no longer welcome in the only world he knew. He tried starting several small businesses and even bought a famous franchise, but they all failed. As he grew older and his strength slipped away, so did his drive to start over again. His lack of will became even more pronounced after each business failure. He was a successful E employee, trying to survive as an S self-employed, a quadrant in which he had no training or experience and for which he had no heart. He loved the world of public education, but he could not find a way to get back in. He died frustrated and a little angry, yet he died with a clear conscience. So what kept me going in the darkest of hours? It was the haunting memory of my educated dad sitting at home waiting for the phone to ring, trying to succeed in the world of business, a world he knew nothing about. That and the joyous memory of seeing my rich dad grow happier and more successful as his years went on inspired me. Instead of declining at age 54, rich dad blossomed. His years of methodically building businesses and investing were paying off, and he was on his way to becoming one of the richest men in the islands. The cash flow quadrant is more than two lines and some letters. If you look below the surface, you will find completely different worlds as well as different ways of looking at the world. As a person who has looked at the world from both the left side of the quadrant and the right side, 
I can honestly say the world looks much different depending on which side you are on. One day over lunch, I talked to my rich dad about my educated dad. Your father and I are not the same people at the core, said rich dad. While we are both human beings, we both have fears, doubts, beliefs, strengths, and weaknesses. We respond or handle those core similarities differently. How we respond to those differences is what causes us to remain in one quadrant or another. When your dad tried to cross over from the E, employee quadrant, intellectually he could understand the process. But he couldn't handle it emotionally. When things did not go smoothly and he began to lose money, he did not know what to do to solve the problems. So he went back to the quadrant he felt most comfortable in, the E and sometimes S quadrant. I said. Rich Dad nodded his head. When the fear of losing money and failing becomes too painful inside, a fear we both have, he chooses to seek security, and I choose to seek freedom. Even though we're all human beings, when it comes to money and the emotions attached to money, we all respond differently, and it's how we respond to those emotions that often determines which quadrant we choose to generate our income from. Different quadrants, different people. I said, "That's right," said Rich Dad. And if you're going to be successful in any quadrant, you need to know more than just technical skills. You also need to know the core differences that cause people to seek different quadrants. Know that, and life will be much easier. What are the differences? How do I tell if people are in E, S, B, or I without knowing much about them? One of the ways is by listening to their words. A person who comes from the E or employee quadrant might say, "I am looking for a safe, secure job with good pay and excellent benefits." A person who comes from the S or self-employed quadrant might say, "My rate is thirty-five dollars per hour," or, "My normal commission rate is six percent of the total price," or. I can't seem to find people who want to work and do the job right, or I've got more than twenty hours into this project. A person operating out of the B or business owner quadrant might say, "I'm looking for a new president to run my company." Lastly, someone operating out of the I or investor quadrant might say, "Is my cash flow based on an internal rate of return or net rate of return?" Words are tools. Once my rich dad knew who the person he was interviewing was at the core, at least for that moment, he would know what that person was really looking for, what he had to offer, and what words to use when speaking to him. Rich dad always said, "Words are powerful tools. If you want to be a leader of people, then you need to be a master of words. One word may excite one type of person, while that same word would completely turn off another person. For example, the word risk might be exciting to a person in the I investor quadrant." While evoking total fear to someone in the E employee quadrant, he would say, "Hear their words, feel their souls," because behind the words a person chooses are the core values and core differences of that individual. When I hear the word "secure" or "benefits," I get a sense of who the person might be at the core. The word "secure" is a word often used in response to the emotion of fear. If a person feels fear. Then the need for security is often a commonly used phrase for someone who comes predominantly from the E employee quadrant. When it comes to money and jobs, there are many people who simply hate the feeling of fear that comes with economic uncertainty. Hence, the desire for security. The word benefit means people would also like some kind of additional reward that is spelled out, a defined and assured extra compensation, such as a health care or retirement plan. The key is that they want to feel secure and see it in writing. Uncertainty does not make them happy. Certainty does. For them, the idea of security is often more important than money. The S self-employed want to be their own bosses, or they like to do their own thing. Often, when it comes to the subject of money, a hardcore S self-employed does not like to have his or her income be dependent on other people. Those who are self-employed do not like having the amount of money they earn dictated by someone else or by a group of people who might not work as hard as they do. They also understand that if they do not work hard, then they don't deserve to be paid much. When it comes to money, they have fiercely independent souls. So while the employee often will respond to the fear of not having money by seeking security, the S self-employed will often respond by taking control of the situation and doing it on their own. When it comes to fear and financial risk, they want to take the bull by the horns. In this group, you find well-educated professionals who spend years in schools, such as doctors, lawyers, and dentists. Also in the S, 
self-employed group are people who took educational paths other than or in addition to traditional school. In this group are direct commission salespeople, real estate agents, small business owners, restaurateurs, consultants, therapists, hairstylists, and artists, to name a few. Self-employed people are often hardcore perfectionists, and that is why we hire them. If you hire a brain surgeon, you want that brain surgeon to have had years of training and experience. But most importantly, you want this brain surgeon to be a perfectionist. The same goes for a dentist, hairstylist, marketing consultant, plumber, lawyer, or a corporate trainer. You, as the client hiring this person, want someone who is the best. For this group, money is not the most important thing about their work. Their independence, the freedom to do things their way, and to be respected as experts in their field are much more important than mere money. Many S self-employed types are hesitant to hire and train other people because once trained, they often end up as their competition. This, in turn, keeps them working harder and doing things on their own. The B business owner could almost be the opposite of the S self-employed. Those who are true Bs like to surround themselves with smart people from all four categories. Unlike the S self-employed. Who do not like to delegate work because no one could do it better. The true B likes to delegate. The true motto of a B is, "Why do it yourself when you can hire someone to do it for you and they can do it better?" Henry Ford fit this mold. My rich dad's idol was Henry Ford. He had me read books about people like Ford and John D. Rockefeller, the founder of Standard Oil. Rich dad constantly encouraged his son and me to learn the essence of leadership and the technical skills of business. There is a science to business and leadership, as well as an art to business and leadership. For me, both are lifelong studies. Leadership, Rich Dad said, is the ability to bring out the best in people. So he trained his son and me in the technical skills necessary to become successful in business. Technical skills such as reading financial statements, marketing, sales, accounting, management, production and negotiations. And he really stressed that we learn to work with and lead people. Rich Dad always said, "The technical skills of business are easy. The hard part is working with people." The difference between an S type of business and a B type of business is, those who are true Bs, business owners, can leave their business for a year or more and return to find their business more profitable and running better than when they left. In a true self-employed type business, if the S left for a year or more, the chances are there would be no business left to return to. So what causes the difference? Saying it simply, an S self-employed owns a job, a B business owner owns a system and then hires competent people to operate the system. Or put another way, in many cases the S self-employed is the system. That is why they cannot leave. To be successful as a B business owner requires ownership or control of systems and the ability to lead people. For S's self-employed to evolve into B's. Business owners, they need to convert who they are and what they know into a system, and many are not able to do that, or they are often too attached to the system. Many people come to me for advice on how to start a company or ask me how to raise money for a new product or idea. I listen usually for about ten minutes, and within that time, I can tell where their focus is. Is it the product or the system of business? In those ten minutes, I most often hear words such as these. Remember the importance of being a good listener and allowing words to direct you to the core value of a person's soul. This is a far better product than company X Y Z makes. I've looked everywhere and nobody has this product. I'll give you the idea for this product. All I want is 25 percent of the profits. I've been working on this product, book, music score, invention for years. These are the words of a person generally operating from the left side of the quadrant, the E employee or S self-employed side. Since I need to be gentle at this time, because we are dealing with core values and ideas, at this point of the conversation, I often use the McDonald's hamburger example for clarification. I slowly ask, "Can you personally make a better hamburger than McDonald's?" So far, 100% of the people I have talked with about their new idea or product have said yes. At this point, I ask them the next question: "Can you personally build a better business system than McDonald's?" Some people see the difference immediately, and some do not. And I would say the difference is whether the person is fixated on the left side of the quadrant, which is focused on the idea of the better burger, or on the right side of the quadrant, which is focused on the system of business.
I do my best to explain that there are a lot of entrepreneurs out there offering far superior products or services, but only McDonald's has the system that has served billions of burgers. The reality is, there are unlimited new ideas, billions of people with services or products to offer, millions of products, and only a few people who know how to build excellent business systems. Bill Gates of Microsoft did not build a great product. He bought somebody else's product and built a powerful global system around it. The I, investor, makes money with money. They do not have to work because their money is working for them. The I, investor quadrant, is the playground of the rich. Regardless of which quadrant people make their money in, if they hope someday to be rich, they ultimately must come to the I quadrant. It is in the I quadrant that money becomes converted to wealth. The cash flow quadrant simply makes distinctions on how income is generated. If you are an E, employee, you have a job. If you are an S, self-employed, you own a job. But if you own a system and people work for you, you are a B, business owner. And finally, if you are an I, investor, your money works for you. A few years ago, I read an article that said most rich people received 70% of their income from investments, or the I, investor quadrant, and less than 30% from wages, or the E, employee quadrant. And if they were an E, employee, the chances were they were employees of their own corporation. For most everyone else, the poor and the middle class, at least 80% of their income comes from wages from the E, employee, or S, self-employed quadrants, and less than 20% from investments, or the I, investor quadrant. Although my wife and I were millionaires by 1989, we were not financially free until 1994. There is a difference between being rich and being wealthy. By 1989, our business was making us a lot of money. We were earning more and working less because the business system was growing without any more physical effort on our part. We still needed to convert the cash flow coming from the business into even more tangible assets that would generate additional cash flow. We had grown our business into a success, and it was time to focus on growing our assets to the point where the cash flow from all our assets would be greater than our living expenses. By 1994, the passive income from all of our assets was greater than our expenses. Then we were wealthy. The definition of wealth is the number of days you can survive without physically working or anyone else in your household physically working and still maintain your standard of living. For example, if your expenses are $1,000 a month and if you have $3,000 in savings, your wealth is approximately three months or 90 days. Wealth is measured in time, not dollars. By 1994, my wife and I were wealthy indefinitely, barring great economic changes, because the income from our investments was greater than our monthly expenses. Ultimately, it is not how much money you make that matters, but how much money you keep and how long that money works for you. Regardless of how much money people make, ultimately they should put some in the I, investor quadrant. The I, investor quadrant, deals specifically with the idea of money making money or the idea that your money works so that you do not have to work. Yet it is important to acknowledge that there are other forms of investing. People invest in their education. Traditional education is important because the better your education, the better your chances of earning money. You can spend four years in college and have your income earning potential go from $24,000 a year to $50,000 a year or more. Given that the average person spends 40 years or more actively working, four years' worth of college or some type of higher education is an excellent investment. Loyalty and hard work is another form of investing, like being a lifelong employee of a company or the government. In return, via contract, that individual is rewarded with a pension for life. That is a form of investment popular in the industrial age, but obsolete in the information age. Other people invest in having large families and in turn have their children care for them in their old age. That form of investing was the norm in the past, yet due to economic constraints in the present, it is becoming more difficult for families to handle the living and medical expenses of parents. Government retirement programs such as Social Security and Medicare in America, which were often paid for through payroll deduction, is another form of investment mandated by law. But due to massive changes in demographics and costs, this form of investment may not be able to keep some of the promises it has made. And there are independent investment vehicles for retirement that are called individual retirement plans. Often the federal government will offer tax incentives to both the employer and employee to participate in such plans. 
In America, one popular plan is the 401k retirement plan, and in countries such as Australia, they are called superannuation plans. Although all of these are forms of investing, the I, investor quadrant, focuses on investments that generate income on an ongoing basis during your working years. In other words, is your money working for you and generating current income for you? Let's look at a person who buys a house as an investment and rents it out. If the rent collected is greater than the expenses to operate the property, that income is coming from the I, investor quadrant. The same is true for people who receive income as interest from savings or dividends from stocks and bonds. So the qualifier for the I, investor quadrant, is how much income you generate from the quadrant without working for it. Besides the obvious advantages of knowing how to make money with money and not having to get up and go to work, there are also many tax advantages that are not available to people who have to work for their money. One of the reasons the rich get richer is because they sometimes can make millions and legally not pay taxes on that money. That's because they make money in the asset column, not in the income column. Or they make money as investors, not workers. Why aren't more people investors? The same reason many people do not start their own businesses. It can be summed up in one word, risk. Many people do not like the idea of handing over their hard-earned money and not having it come back. Many people are so afraid of losing, they choose not to invest or risk their money at all, no matter how much money they could make in return. The fear of losing money seems to divide investors into four broad categories. First, people who are risk-adverse and do nothing but play it safe, keeping their money in the bank. Second, people who turn the job of investing over to someone else, such as a financial advisor or mutual fund manager. Third, gamblers, for whom investing is a game of chance. And finally, investors, for whom investing is a game of skill. For the people who turn their money over to someone else to invest, investing is often a game they do not want to learn. The important thing for these individuals is to choose a financial advisor carefully. The good news about investing is that risk can be greatly minimized or even eliminated and you can still receive high yields on your money if you know the game. It is the fear of losing money that causes most people to seek security. Yet the I, investor quadrant, is not as treacherous as many people think. It has its own skills and mindset. The skills to be successful in the I, investor quadrant, can be learned if you're willing to take the time to learn them. When I was a boy, my rich dad encouraged me to take risks with my money and learn to invest. He would always say, if you want to get rich, you need to learn how to take risks, learn to be an investor. At home, I told my educated dad about my rich dad's suggestion that we learn how to invest and learn to manage risk. My educated dad replied, I don't need to learn how to invest. I have a government pension plan, a pension from the teachers union, and social security benefits guaranteed. Why take risks with my money? My educated dad believed in industrial age pension plans, such as government employee pensions and social security. He was happy when I signed up for the U.S. Marine Corps. Instead of being worried that I might lose my life in Vietnam, he simply said, stay in for 20 years and you'll get a pension and medical benefits for life. Although still in use, such pension plans officially have become obsolete. The idea of a company being financially responsible for your retirement and the government picking up the balance of your retirement needs through pension schemes is an old idea that is no longer viable. People need to become investors. As we move from defined benefit pension plans, or what I call industrial age retirement plans, to defined contribution pension plans, or information age pension plans, the result is that you as an individual must now be financially responsible for yourself. Many people who have spent their lives avoiding financial risks are now being forced to take them. A large majority of these people, the E's, employees, and S's, self-employed, are people who by nature are security-oriented. That is why they seek secure jobs or secure careers or start small businesses they can control. They are migrating today because of the defined contribution retirement plans to the I, investor quadrant, where they hope they will find security for when their working years are over. Unfortunately, the I quadrant is not known for its security. The I quadrant is the quadrant of risk. Because so many people on the left side of the cash flow quadrant come looking for security, the stock market responds in kind. That is why people who seek security use diversification as an investment strategy for not losing. It is not an investment strategy for winning. Successful or rich investors do not diversify. They focus their efforts. Learn to manage risk. 
It is possible to invest for high returns with low risk. All you have to do is learn how it's done. It is not hard. In fact, it's much like learning how to ride a bike. In the early stages, you may fall down, but after a while, the falling stops and investing becomes second nature, just as riding a bicycle is for most of us. The problem with the left side of the cash flow quadrant is that most people go there to avoid financial risk. Instead of avoiding risk, I recommend learning how to manage financial risk. People who take risks change the world. Too many people have come to depend on government to eliminate the risks of life. The beginning of the information age is the end of big government as we know it. Big government has just become too expensive. Unfortunately, the millions of people around the world that have come to depend upon the idea of entitlements and pensions for life will be left behind financially. The information age means we all need to become more self-sufficient and begin to grow up. The times are changing. My concern in this program is for those individuals who want to make the move from the left side of the quadrant to the right side, but don't know where to start. Anyone can make the move with the right skills and determination. Why people choose security over freedom? The primary reason many people seek job security is because that is what they were taught to seek at home and at school. Because most of us learn little to nothing about money at home or at school. It is only natural that many of us cling even more tightly to the idea of job security instead of reaching for financial freedom. If you analyze the cash flow quadrant, you will notice that the left side is motivated by security and the right side is motivated by freedom. Trapped by debt. The main reason that 90% of the population is working on the left side is simply because that is the side they learn about in school. They then leave school and are soon deeply in debt so deeply in debt that they must cling even tighter to a job or professional security just to pay the bills. If we track the life of average educated people, the financial script often goes like this. The child goes to school, graduates, finds a job, and soon has some money to spend. The young adult can now afford to rent an apartment, buy a TV set, new clothes, some furniture, and of course a car. And now the bills begin to come in. One day, the adult meets someone special, sparks fly, they fall in love and get married. For a while, life is blissful because two can live as cheaply as one. They now have two incomes, only one rent to pay, and they can afford to set a few dollars aside to buy the dream of all young couples, their own home. They find their dream home, pull the money from savings and use it for a down payment on the house, and now they have a mortgage. Because they have a new house, they need new furnishings. So they find a furniture store that advertises those magic words, no money down, easy monthly payments. Life is wonderful, and they throw a party to have all their friends over to see their new house, new car, new furniture, and new toys. They are now deeply in debt for the rest of their lives. Then the first child arrives. The average, well-educated, hard-working couple, after dropping the child off at nursery school, must now put their nose to the grindstone and go to work. They become trapped by the need for job security simply because, on average, they are less than three months away from financial bankruptcy. From these people you often hear, I can't afford to quit. I have bills to pay. The Money Trap Success on the right side of the quadrant requires a knowledge about money called financial intelligence. Rich Dad defined it this way. Financial intelligence is not how much money you make, but how much money you keep, how hard that money works for you, and how many generations you keep it for. If people lack basic financial intelligence, they will, in most cases, not survive on the right side of the quadrant. My rich dad was good with money and with people at work. He had to be. He was responsible for creating money, managing as few people as possible, keeping costs low and keeping profits high. Those are the skills necessary for success on the right side of the quadrant. It was my rich dad who stressed to me that your home is not an asset, but a liability. He could prove it, because he taught us to be financially literate, so we were able to read numbers. He had the free time to teach his son and me, because he was good at managing people. His skills from work carried over into his home life. My educated dad did not manage money and people at work, although he thought he did. As the state superintendent of education, he was a government official with a multi-million dollar budget and thousands of employees. But it was not money he created. It was taxpayers' money, and his job was to spend all of it. If he did not spend it, the government would give him less money the next year. So at the end of each fiscal year, he was looking for ways to spend it all, which meant he often hired more people to justify next year's budget. The funny thing was, the more people he hired, the more problems he had. As a young boy, observing both fathers, 
I began to take mental notes of what kind of life I wanted to lead. My educated dad was a voracious reader of books, so he was word literate, but he was not financially literate. Because he could not read numbers, he had to take the advice of his banker and accountant, and both told him that his house was an asset and that it should be his largest investment. Because of this financial advice, not only did my highly educated dad work harder, but he also got further into debt. Every time he received a promotion for his hard work, he also got a pay raise, and with each pay raise, he went into a higher tax bracket. He made more money, but all that happened was his taxes increased and his debt increased. He became more emotionally attached to his job and the paycheck that paid the bills. The more insecure he felt, the more he sought security. Your two biggest expenses, because my dad could not read financial statements, he could not see the money trap he was getting into as he grew more successful. It's the same money trap I see millions of other successful, hardworking people fall into. The reason so many people struggle financially is because every time they make more money, they also increase their two biggest expenses: taxes and interest on debt. To top it off, the government often offers you tax breaks to get deeper into debt. Doesn't that make you a little suspicious? I know many people search for freedom and happiness. The problem is most people have not been trained to work from the B business owner and I investor quadrants. Because of this lack of training, the programming into job security, and their increasing amount of debt, most people limit their search for financial freedom to the left side of the cash flow quadrant. Unfortunately, financial security or financial freedom are seldom found in the E employee or S self-employed quadrant. True security and freedom are found on the right side. Going from job to job in search of freedom. One thing the cash flow quadrant is useful for is to track or observe a person's life pattern. Many people spend their lives in search of security or freedom, but wind up instead going from job to job. For example, I have a friend from high school. I hear from him about every five years, and he is always excited because he has found the perfect job. He is ecstatic because he has found the company of his dreams. He loves the company. It's doing exciting things. He loves his work. He has an important title. The pay is great. The people are great. The benefits are great, and his chances for promotion are great. About four and a half years later, I hear from him again, and by this time he is dissatisfied. The company he works for is now corrupt and dishonest in his opinion. It doesn't treat its workers with respect. He hates his boss. He was passed over for promotion, and they don't pay him enough. Six months go by, and he's happy again. He's ecstatic because he's found the perfect job, again. His life pattern is going from job to job. So far, he lives well because he is smart, attractive, and personable. But the years are catching up with him, and younger people are now getting the jobs he used to get. He has a few thousand dollars in savings, nothing set aside for retirement, a house he will never own, child support payments, and college yet to pay for. His youngest child, eight, lives with his ex-wife, and his oldest child, fourteen, lives with him. He used to always say to me, "I don't have to worry. I'm still young. I have time." I wonder if he's saying that now. In my opinion, he needs to make a serious effort to begin moving to either the B business owner or the I investor quadrant quickly. A new attitude and a new educational process need to begin. Unless he gets lucky and wins the lottery or finds a rich woman to marry, he is on a course of working hard for the rest of his life. Doing your own thing, employees become self-employed. Another common pattern is someone going from E employee to S self-employed. During this current period of massive downsizing, many people are getting the message and are leaving their jobs with big companies to start their own businesses. There is a boom in so-called home-based businesses. So. Many people made the decision to start their own businesses, do their own thing, and be their own bosses. Of all the life paths, this is the one I feel for the most. In my opinion, being an S self-employed can be the most rewarding and also the most risky. I think the S self-employed quadrant is the hardest quadrant there is. The failure rates are high, and if you make it, being successful can be worse than failing. That is because if you are successful as an S self-employed, you will work harder than if you were in any of the other quadrants, and you will work harder for a long time, for as long as you are successful. The reason S's self-employed work the hardest is because they typically are the proverbial chief cook and bottle washer. They have to do or be responsible for all the jobs that in a bigger company are done by many managers and employees. 
An S, self-employed, just starting out, often answers the phone, pays the bills, makes sales calls, tries to advertise on a small budget, handles customers, hires employees, fires employees, fills in when employees do not show up, talks to the tax man, fights off to government inspectors, and on and on. Personally, I cringe whenever I hear people say they're going to start their own businesses. I wish them well, yet I feel great concern for them. I've seen so many E's, employees, take their life savings or borrow money from friends and family to start their own businesses. After three or so years of struggle and hard work, the businesses fold, and instead of building on their life savings, they are left paying off debt. Nationally, nine out of ten of these types of businesses fail in five years. Of the one that is remaining, nine out of ten of them fail in the next five years. In other words, 99 out of 100 small businesses ultimately disappear in 10 years. I think the reason most fail in the first five years is due to the lack of experience and lack of capital. The reason the one survivor often fails in the second five years is not due to lack of capital, but lack of energy. The hours of long, hard work finally get to the person. Many S's just burn out. That is why many highly educated professionals change firms or try to start something new or die. Maybe that is why the average life expectancy for doctors and lawyers is lower than it is for most others. Their average life expectancy is 58. For everyone else, it is in the 70s. For those who do survive, they seem to have become used to the idea of getting up, going to work, and working hard forever. That seems to be all they know. A friend's parents remind me of this. For 45 years, they have spent long hours in their liquor store on a street corner. As crime increased in their neighborhood, they had to put steel bars up on the doors and all the windows. Today, money has passed through a slot, much like in a bank. I go by occasionally to see them. They are wonderful, sweet people, but it saddens me to see them as virtual prisoners in their own business, from ten in the morning till two the next morning, staring out from behind the bars. Many wise S's, self-employed, sell their businesses at their peak before they run out of steam to someone with energy and money. They take some time off and they start something new. They keep doing their own thing and love it. Importantly, they know when to get out. If you were born prior to 1930, the advice, go to school, get good grades, find a safe, secure job, was good advice. But if you were born after 1930, it is bad advice. For people who earn their income out of the E, employee quadrant, there are virtually no tax breaks left. Today in America, being an employee means you are a 50-50 partner with the government. That means the government ultimately will take 50% or more of an employee's earnings, and much of that even before the employee sees the paycheck. When you consider that the government offers you tax breaks for going further into debt, the path to financial freedom is virtually impossible for most people in the E, employee quadrant, and for most in the S, self-employed quadrant. I often hear accountants tell clients who begin earning more income from the E, employee quadrant, to buy a bigger house so they can receive a bigger tax break. While that might make sense to someone on the left side of the cash flow quadrant, that makes no sense to someone on the right side of the quadrant. Who pays the most taxes? The rich pay few income taxes. Why? Simply because they do not earn their money as employees. The ultra-rich know that the best way to avoid taxes legally is by generating that income out of the B, business owner, and I, investor quadrants. If people earn money in the E, employee quadrant, the only tax break they are offered is to buy a bigger house and go into greater debt. From the right side of the cash flow quadrant, that is not too financially intelligent. To people on the right side, that is the same as saying, give me one dollar and I will give you fifty cents back. I often hear people say, it's un-American not to pay taxes. Americans who say this seem to have forgotten their history. America was founded out of tax protest. Have they forgotten the infamous Boston Tea Party of 1773? The rebellion that led to the Revolutionary War, which separated the American colonies from the oppressive taxes of England? Taxes are a necessity of modern civilization, but problems arise when taxes become abusive and mismanaged. Taxes and debt are two of the main reasons most people never feel financially secure or achieve financial freedom. The path to security or freedom is found on the right-hand side of the cash flow quadrant you need to go beyond job security. It is time to know the difference between financial security and financial freedom. What is the difference between job security, financial security, and financial freedom? As you know, my highly educated dad was fixated on job security, as are people of his generation. 
He assumed that job security meant financial security. That was until he lost his job and could not get another job. My rich dad never talked about job security. He talked instead about financial freedom. The answer to finding the kind of security or freedom you desire can be in observing the patterns found in the cash flow quadrant. The pattern for job security. People who go from school to the E employee quadrant are often good at performing their jobs. Many spent years in school and years on the job gaining experience. The problem is they know little about the B business owner quadrant or the I investor quadrant, even if they have retirement plans. They feel financially insecure because they have been trained only for job or professional security. The pattern for financial security. To become more financially secure, I suggest, in addition to performing their jobs in the E employee or S self-employed quadrants, individuals become educated in the B business owner or I investor quadrants. This is the pattern of study my rich dad recommended. It is the path to financial freedom. This is true financial freedom because in the B business owner quadrant, people are working for you, and in the I investor quadrant, your money is working for you. You are free to work or not to work. Your knowledge in these two quadrants has brought you complete physical freedom from work. If you look at the ultra rich, their pattern in the quadrant typically reveals that they start as a B business owner, and then they become an I investor. This signifies the income pattern of Bill Gates of Microsoft. Warren Buffett of Berkshire Hathaway and Ross Perot. A quick word of caution: the B business owner quadrant is much different from the I investor quadrant. I have seen many successful B's business owners sell their businesses for millions, and their newfound wealth goes to their heads. They tend to think that their dollars are a measure of their IQ, so they swagger on down to the I investor quadrant and lose it all. The game and rules are different in all of the quadrants. Which is why I recommend education over ego. Just as in the case of financial security, having income generated from two quadrants gives you greater stability in the world of financial freedom. There are different financial paths people can choose. Unfortunately, most people choose the path of job security. When the economy starts wobbling, they often cling more desperately to job security. They wind up spending their lives there. At a minimum, I recommend becoming educated in financial security, which is feeling confident about your job and feeling confident about your ability to invest in good times and in bad times. A big secret is that true investors make more money in bad markets. They make their money because the non-investors are panicking and selling when they should be buying. That is why I'm not afraid of the possible coming economic changes, because change means wealth is being transferred. Your boss cannot make you rich. The economic changes currently happening are partly from the sales and mergers of companies. The reality is, your boss's job is not to make you rich. Your boss's job is to make sure you get your paycheck. It is your job to become rich if you want to, and that job begins the moment you receive your paycheck. If you have poor money management skills, then all the money in the world cannot save you. If you budget your money wisely and learn about either the B business owner or I investor quadrant. Then you are on your own path to great personal fortune and, most importantly, freedom. The path I recommend. I am often asked by people on the left side of the quadrant, "What path would you recommend?" I recommend the same path my rich dad recommended to me, the same path that people like Ross Perot, Bill Gates, and others took. The path goes from E employee to B business owner, and then to I investor, or from S self-employed to B. Business owner, and again to I investor. I occasionally receive this complaint, but I'd rather be an investor. To which I reply, then go to the I investor quadrant. If you have plenty of money and lots of free time, go straight to the I investor quadrant. But if you don't have an abundance of time and money, the path I recommend is safer. In most cases, people do not have an abundance of time or money, so they then ask another question: Why do you recommend the B business owner quadrant first? There are two reasons. First, experience and education. If you are first successful as a B business owner, you will have a better chance of developing into a powerful I investor. If you first develop a solid business sense, you can become a better investor. You will be better able to identify other good Bs business owners. True investors invest in successful Bs business owners with stable business systems. 
It is risky to invest in an E, employee, or an S, self-employed, who does not know the difference between a system and a product, or who lacks excellent leadership skills. The second reason I recommend the B, business owner quadrant, is cash flow. If you have a business that is up and running, then you should have the free time and the cash flow to support the ups and downs of the I, investor quadrant. Many times I meet people from the ES quadrants who are so tight on cash they could not afford to take any kind of financial loss. One market swing and they are wiped out financially because they operate financially at red line. The reality is, investing is capital and knowledge intensive. Sometimes it takes lots of capital and time to gain that knowledge. Many successful investors have lost many times before winning. Successful people know that success is a poor teacher. Learning comes from making mistakes. And in the I, investor quadrant, mistakes cost money. If you lack both knowledge and capital, it's financial suicide to try to become an investor. By developing the skill of becoming a good B, business owner, first, you will also be providing the cash flow necessary to move on to becoming a good investor. The business you develop as a B, business owner, will provide the cash to support you as you gain the education to become a good investor. Once you have gained the education to become a successful investor, you will understand how I can say, it does not always take money to make money. The good news is, technology has also made it easier to be successful in the B, business owner quadrant. Although it's not as easy as just getting a minimum wage job, the systems are in place now for more and more people to find financial success as B, business owners. The Kinds of Business Systems In moving to the B, business owner quadrant, Remember that your goal is to own a system and have people work that system for you. You can develop the business system yourself, or you can look for a system to purchase. Think of the system as the bridge that will allow you to cross safely from the left side of the cash flow quadrant to the right side, your bridge to financial freedom. There are three main types of business systems commonly in use today. They are traditional C-type corporations, where you develop your own system, franchises, where you buy an existing system, and network marketing, where you buy into and become part of an existing system. Each has its strengths and weaknesses, yet each ultimately does the same thing. If operated properly, each system will provide a steady stream of income without much physical effort on the part of the owner, once it is up and running. The problem is getting it up and running. In 1985, when people asked, why were you homeless, Kim and I simply said, we were building a business system. It was a business system that was a hybrid of the traditional C-type corporation and a franchise. As stated before, the B, business owner quadrant, requires a knowledge of both systems and people. Our decision to develop our own system meant a lot of hard work. I had taken this route before, and my company had failed. Although it was successful for years, it suddenly went broke in its fifth year. When success came to us, we were not ready with an adequate system. The system began to break down, even though we had hard-working people. We felt like we were on a good-sized yacht that had sprung a leak, but we could not find the leak. All of us were trying to figure out where the leak was, but we could not bail water fast enough to find the leak and fix it. Even if we found it, we were not certain we could plug it. When I was in high school, my rich dad told his son and me that he had lost a company when he was in his twenties. That was the best and worst experience of my life, he said. As much as I hated it, I learned more by repairing it and eventually turning it into a huge success. Knowing that I was contemplating starting my own company, Rich Dad said to me, you may lose two or three companies before you build a successful one that lasts. He was training Mike, his son, to take over his empire. Because my dad was a government employee, I was not going to inherit an empire. I had to build my own. Rich Dad always said, we learn the most about ourselves when we fail, so don't be afraid of failing. Failing is part of the process of success. You cannot have success without failure. So unsuccessful people are people who never fail. Maybe it was a self-fulfilling prophecy, but in 1984, the company that went down was my third company. I had made millions and had lost millions, and was starting all over again when I met Kim. The reason I know she did not marry for my money is because I did not have any money. When I told her what I was going to do, build company number four, she did not back away. I'll build it with you, was her reply, and she was true to her word. Along with another partner, we built a business system with 11 offices worldwide that generated income regardless of whether we worked. Building it from nothing to 11 offices took five years of blood, sweat, and tears, but it worked. Both dads were happy for me and sincerely congratulated me. 
They had both lost money in my previous experiments at starting companies. When my rich dad began teaching me about becoming a B business owner, there was only one kind of business. That was big business, a major corporation that usually dominated the town. In our town in Hawaii, it was the sugar plantation that controlled virtually everything, including the other big businesses. As I started high school, we began to hear about a thing called franchises, but none had come to our little town. We had not heard about McDonald's or Kentucky Fried Chicken or Taco Bell. They were not a part of our vocabulary while I was studying with Rich Dad. When we did hear rumors about them, we heard they were illegal, fraudulent scams and dangerous. Naturally, upon hearing those rumors, Rich Dad flew to California to begin checking franchises out rather than believing the gossip. When he returned, all he said was, "Franchises are the wave of the future," and he bought the rights to two of them. His wealth skyrocketed as the idea of franchises caught on, and he began selling his rights to other people so they could have a chance at building their own businesses. When I asked him if I should buy one from him, he simply said, "No, you've come this far in learning how to build your own business system. Don't stop now. Franchises are for people who do not want to build or do not know how to build their own systems. Besides, you don't have the two hundred fifty thousand dollars it takes to buy a franchise from me." The way I learned to become a B business owner was by being an apprentice to my rich dad. His son and I were both E's employees, learning to be B's business owners. And that is the way many people learn. It's called on-the-job training. This is the way many closely held family empires are passed on from one generation to the next. The problem is, not too many people are privileged or lucky enough to learn the behind-the-scene aspects of becoming a B business owner. Most corporate management training programs are just that. The company only trains you to be a manager. Few teach what it takes to try to be a B business owner. Often people get stuck in the S self-employed quadrant in their journey to the B business owner quadrant. This happens primarily because they do not develop a strong enough system, and so they end up becoming an integral part of the system. Successful Bs business owners develop a system that will run without their involvement. How to learn to become a B business owner? There are three ways you can make it to the B business owner side quickly. You can find a mentor, buy a franchise, or develop network marketing. My rich dad was my mentor. A mentor is someone who has already done what you want to do and is successful at doing it. Do not find an advisor. An advisor is someone who tells you how to do it but has not personally done it. Most advisors are in the S self-employed quadrant. The world is filled with S's trying to tell you how to be a B or an I. My rich dad was a mentor, not an advisor. One of the biggest tips my rich dad gave was: be careful of the advice you take. While you must keep your mind open, always be first aware of which quadrant the advice is coming from. My rich dad taught me about systems and how to be a leader of people, not a manager of people. Managers often see their subordinates as inferiors. Leaders must direct people who are often smarter. A traditional way of learning about systems is to get your MBA from a prestigious school and get a fast track job up the corporate ladder. An MBA is important because you learn the basics of accounting and how the financial numbers relate to the systems of a business. Yet, just because you have an MBA does not automatically mean you are competent to run all the systems that ultimately make up a complete business system. To learn about all the systems necessary in a big company, you'll need to spend 10 to 15 years there, learning all the different aspects of the business. You should then be prepared to leave and start your own company. Working for a successful major corporation is like being paid by your mentor. Even with a mentor and/or years of experience, this first method is labor-intensive. To create your own system requires a lot of trial and error, upfront legal costs, and paperwork. All of this occurs at the same time you are trying to develop your people. Another way to become a B business owner is through franchises. Another way to learn about systems is to buy a franchise. When you buy a franchise, you are buying a tried and proven operating system. There are many excellent franchises. By buying the franchise system instead of trying to create your own, you can focus on developing your people. Buying the system removes one big variable when you are learning how to be a B business owner. The reason many banks will loan money on a franchise and not to a small startup business is because the banks recognize the importance of systems and how starting with a good system will lower their risk. A word of caution if you buy a franchise. Please do not be an S self-employed who wants to do your own thing. If you buy a franchise system, be an E employee. Just do it exactly the way they tell you to do it. Nothing is more tragic than the courtroom fights between franchisees and franchisors. 
The fights occur usually because the people who buy the system really want to do it their way, not the way the person who created the system wants it run. If you want to do your own thing, then do it after you've mastered both systems and people. The final way to become a B business owner is through network marketing, also called multi-level marketing or direct distribution systems. Just as with franchises, the legal system initially attempted to outlaw network marketing, and I know of some countries that have succeeded in outlawing or severely restricting it. After I began researching network marketing, I found that there were many people who were sincerely and diligently building successful network marketing businesses. When I met these people, I saw the impact that their businesses had on other people's lives and financial futures. I began to truly appreciate the value of the network marketing system. For a reasonable entry fee, often around two hundred dollars, people can buy into an existing system and immediately start building their businesses. Due to the technological advances in the computer industry, these organizations are totally automated, and the headaches of paperwork, order processing, distribution, accounting, and follow-up are almost entirely managed by the network marketing software systems. New distributors can focus all their efforts in building their businesses through sharing this automated business opportunity instead of worrying about the normal startup headaches of small businesses. One of my old friends, who did more than a billion dollars in real estate in 1997, recently signed on as a network marketing distributor and began building his business. I was surprised to find him so diligently building a network marketing business because he definitely did not need the money. When I asked him why, he explained it this way: I went to school to become a CPA and to have an MBA in finance. When people ask me how I became so rich, I tell them about the multi-million-dollar real estate transactions I do and the hundreds of thousands of dollars in passive income I receive each year from my real estate. I then notice that some of them withdraw or shy away. We both know that their chances of doing multi-million-dollar real estate investments, like I do, are slim to none. Besides not having the educational background, they do not have the extra capital to invest. So I began to look for a way I could help them achieve the same level of passive income I develop from real estate, without going back to school for six years and spending twelve years investing in real estate. I believe network marketing gives people the opportunity to build up the passive income they need for support while they learn to become professional investors. That is why I recommend network marketing to them. Even if they have little money, they can still invest sweat equity for five years and begin to generate more than enough passive income to begin investing. By developing their own businesses, they have the free time to learn and the capital to invest with me in my bigger deals. My friend is now doing as well in his network marketing business as in his investment business. He told me I did it initially because I wanted to help people find the money to invest, and now I'm getting rich from a whole new business. And that's why today I recommend people consider network marketing. Many famous franchises cost a million dollars or more to buy. Network marketing is buying a personal franchise, often for less than two hundred dollars. I know much of network marketing is hard work, but success in any quadrant is hard work. From my research into network marketing, I found two important things you can learn through their programs that are essential in becoming a successful B business owner. To be successful, you need to learn to overcome your fear of being rejected and to stop worrying about what other people will say about you. So many times I've met people who hold themselves back simply because of what their friends might say if they did something different. I know because I was the same way, and. You need to learn to lead people. Working with different kinds of people is the hardest thing about business. The people I have met who are successful in any business are those who are natural leaders. The ability to get along and inspire people is a priceless skill, a skill that can be learned. At this point of the program, we will assume that you have become familiar with the quadrant concept, and will refer to each quadrant by its letter classification only: E for employee, S for self-employed. B for business owner and I for investor. As I said, the transition from the left quadrant to the right quadrant is not so much what you do, but whom you have to become. Learn how to handle rejection, how not to be affected by what other people think of you, and learn to lead people, and you will find prosperity. So I endorse any network marketing organization that is first committed to developing you as a human being, more than developing you into a salesperson. I would seek organizations that have successful track records, a distribution system, and a compensation plan that has been successful for years, a business opportunity you can succeed with, believe in, and share confidently with others, ongoing, long-term educational programs to develop you as a human being. Self-confidence is vital on the right side of the quadrant, as well as a strong mentor program. You want to learn from leaders, not advisors. 
people who are already leaders on the right side of the quadrant and want you to succeed. And finally, I'd choose an organization that has people you respect and enjoy being with. If the organization meets these criteria, then and only then look at the product. A system is a bridge to freedom. Being homeless was not an experience I want to repeat. Yet for Kim and me, the experience was priceless. Today, freedom and security are found not so much in what we have, but what we know we can create with confidence. Since that time, we have created or helped develop a real estate company, an oil company, a mining company, and two education companies. So the process of learning how to create a successful system was beneficial for us. Yet I would not recommend the process to anyone unless they truly want to go through it. Until only a few years ago, the possibility of a person becoming successful in the B quadrant was only available to those who were brave or rich. Kim and I must have been brave because we certainly weren't rich. The reason so many people stay stuck in the left side of the quadrant is because they feel the risks involved in developing their own systems are too great. For them, it is smarter to remain safe and secure in a job. Today, primarily due to changes in technology, the risk in becoming a successful business owner has been greatly reduced and the opportunity to own your own business system has been made available to virtually everyone. Franchises and network marketing took away the hard part of developing your own system. You acquire the rights to a proven system, and then your only job is to develop your people. Think of these business systems as bridges. Bridges that will provide a path for you to cross safely from the left side to the right side of the cash flow quadrant. Your bridge to financial freedom. The Seven Levels of Investors my rich dad once asked me, what is the difference between a person who bets on horses and a person who picks stocks? I don't know, was my response. Not much, was his answer. Never be the person who buys the stock. What you want to be when you grow up is the person who creates the stock that brokers sell and others buy. For a long time, I did not understand what my rich dad really meant. It was not until I started teaching investing to others that I really understood the different types of investors. A special thanks goes to John Burley, an authority in real estate and a fellow teacher. He developed the original six levels of investors, which I have modified over the years. See if you recognize anyone you know. Using this identification method in concert with the cash flow quadrant will allow you to understand the world of investors and learn how you can change your own attitudes and investment future. Level zero, those with nothing to invest. These people have no money to invest. They either spend everything they make or spend more than they make. There are many rich people who would fall into this category because they spend as much or more than they make. Unfortunately, this zero level is where about 50% of the adult population would be categorized. Level 1. Borrowers. These people solve financial problems by borrowing money. Often they even invest with borrowed money. Their idea of financial planning is robbing Peter to pay Paul. They live their financial lives with their heads in the sand like ostriches, hoping and praying that everything will work out. While they may have a few assets, the reality is that their level of debt is simply too high. For the most part, they are not conscious about money and their spending habits. Anything they own of value has debt attached to it. They use credit cards impulsively and then roll that debt into a long-term home equity loan so they can clean up their credit cards and then start charging again. If the value of their homes goes up, they borrow on the equity again or buy larger and more expensive homes. They believe the value of real estate only goes up. The words low-down, easy monthly payments has always drawn their attention. They often purchase depreciating toys or doodads such as boats, swimming pools, vacations, and cars with those words in mind. They list these depreciating toys as assets and go back to the bank for another loan and wonder why they get turned down. Shopping is their favorite form of exercise. They buy things they don't need, saying to themselves, Oh, go ahead, you deserve it, or you're worth it, or if I don't buy it now, I may never find it again at such a great price. They think spreading debt over a long period of time is smart, always kidding themselves that they'll work harder and pay off their bills someday. They spend everything they make and then some. If they have money, it gets spent. If they don't have the money, they borrow it. When asked what their problem is, they will say they just don't make enough money. They think more money will solve the problem. No matter how much they make, they only get deeper into debt. They fail to see that the problem is not necessarily income or lack of it, but rather their money habits. They often argue with loved ones about money, emphatically defending their need to buy this or that. They live in complete financial denial, pretending that miraculously their money problems will someday disappear, or they pretend they will always have enough money to spend on whatever they desire. 
This level of investor can often look rich. They may have big houses and flashy cars, but if you check, they buy on borrowed money. They may also make a lot of money, but they are one professional accident away from financial ruin. Level 2. Savers. These people put aside a small amount of money, usually, on a regular basis. The money is in a low-risk, low-return vehicle such as a money market checking account, savings account, or certificate of deposit, CD. If they have an individual retirement account, IRA, they have it with a bank or in a mutual fund cash account. They often save to consume rather than to invest, saving for a new TV, car, vacation, etc. They believe in paying in cash. They are afraid of credit and debt. Instead, they like the security of money in the bank. Even when shown that in today's economic environment, savings give a negative return after inflation and taxes, they are still unwilling to take on much risk. Little do they know that the U.S. dollar has lost 90% of its value since 1950 and continues to lose value annually at a greater rate than the interest a bank pays them. They often have whole life insurance policies because they love the feeling of security. People in this group often waste their most precious asset, which is time, trying to save pennies. They spent hours clipping coupons from the newspaper, and then at the supermarket they hold up everyone else in line, fumbling to find those big savings. Instead of trying to save pennies, they could have put that time into learning how to invest. If they had put $10,000 into John Templeton's fund in 1954 and forgotten about it, it would have been worth $2.4 million in 1994. Or if they'd put $10,000 into George Soros's quantum fund in 1969, it would have been worth $22.1 million in 1994. Instead, their deep need for security, which is fear-based, keeps them saving in low-yield investments, such as bank CDs. You often hear these people saying, a penny saved is a penny earned, or I'm saving for the kids. The real truth is that there is often some deep insecurity running them in their lives. In truth, they often shortchange themselves and the people they are saving for. They are almost the exact opposite of the level one investor. It is good to have some savings. It is recommended that you have six months to a year's worth of living expenses held in cash. But after that, there are far better and safer investment vehicles than money in the bank. To hold your money in the bank earning 5% while others are getting 15% and more is not a wise investment strategy. Level 3. Smart Investors There are three different types of investors in this group. This level of investor is aware of the need to invest. They may even participate in the company retirement plan, 401k, SEP, superannuation, pension, etc. Sometimes they even have outside investments in mutual funds, stocks, bonds, or limited partnerships. Generally, they are intelligent people who have a solid education. They make up the two-thirds of the country we call the middle class. However, when it comes to investing, they are often not educated or lack what the investment industry calls sophistication. Rarely will they read a company annual report or company prospectus. How could they? They were not trained to read financial reports. They lack financial literacy. They may have advanced college degrees and may be doctors or even accountants, but few have ever been formally trained and educated in the win-lose world of investing. These are the three main categories in this level, specifically those who can't be bothered, those who are cynics, and those who are gamblers. They are often smart people who are well-educated and often make substantial incomes, and they do invest, yet there are differences. Of the group that can't be bothered, they have convinced themselves they don't understand money and never will. They say things like, I'm just too busy, or it's just too complicated, or investing is too risky. These people just let the money sit and do little in their retirement plan or turn it over to a financial planner who recommends diversification. They block their financial future out of their minds, work hard day to day, and say to themselves, at least I have a retirement plan. When they retire, then they'll look at how their investments did. The second category is the cynic. These people know all the reasons why an investment will not work. They are dangerous to have around. They often sound intelligent, speak with authority, are successful in their chosen fields, but are really cowards under their intellectual exterior. They can tell you exactly how and why you will get swindled with every investment known to man. When you ask for their opinions on a stock or other investment, you walk away feeling terrible, often afraid or doubtful. Their most commonly repeated words are, well, I've been taken before. They're not going to do that to me again. Yet, strangely, these same cynics often follow the market like sheep. At work, they're always reading the financial pages or the Wall Street Journal. They read the paper and then tell everyone else what they know at the coffee break. They talk about the big deals, but are never in them. 
They look for stocks that make the front page, and if the report is favorable, they often buy. The problem is they buy late, because if you get your news from the newspaper, it is too late. The truly smart investors have bought way before it makes the news. The cynic does not know that. When bad news comes, they criticize and say things like, I knew it. They think they're in the game, but they're really only spectators standing on the sidelines. They often want to get into the game, but deep down they are terribly afraid of getting hurt. Security is more important than fun. Cynics are often what professional traders call pigs. They squeal a lot and then run to their own slaughter. They buy high and sell low. Why? Because they're so smart, they've become overly cautious. They are smart, but are terrified of taking risks and making mistakes. So they study harder, get smarter. The more they know, the more risk they see. So they study even harder. Their cynical caution causes them to wait until it's too late. They come to market when greed finally overpowers their fear. They come to the trough with the other pigs and get slaughtered. But the worst part about cynics is that they infect the people around them with their deep fear, disguised as intelligence. When it comes to investing, they can tell you why things won't work, but they can't tell you how they could work. It is possible to get rich quickly with little money and with little risk. It is possible, but only if you are willing to do your part to make it possible. One of the things you need to do is keep an open mind and beware of cynics as well as con men. They are both financially dangerous. The third category of this level is the gambler. This group is also called pigs by professional traders. But while the cynic is overly cautious, this group is not cautious enough. They look at the stock market or any investment market about the same way they look at a Las Vegas craps table. It's just luck. Throw the dice and pray. This group has no set trading rules or principles. They want to act like the big boys so they fake it until they make it or lose it all. The latter is most probable. They are searching for the secret to investing or the holy grail. They are always looking for new and exciting ways to invest. Instead of long-term diligence and study and understanding, they seek tips or shortcuts. They jump into commodities, initial public offerings, IPOs, penny stocks, gas and oil, cattle, and every other investment known to mankind. They like to use sophisticated investment techniques, such as margins, puts, calls, and options. They jump into the game without knowing who the players are and who makes up the rules. These people are the worst investors the planet has ever known. They always try to hit a home run. They usually strike out. When asked how they are doing, they are always, oh, about even or a little bit up. In actuality, they have lost money, lots of money, often huge amounts of money. This type of investor loses money over 90% of the time. They never discuss their losses. They only remember the killing they made six years ago. They think they were smart and fail to recognize they were merely lucky. They think that all they need is the one big deal and then they'll be on easy street. Society calls these people incurable gamblers. Deep down, they are simply lazy when it comes to investing money. Level 4. Long-term investors. These investors are clearly aware of the need to invest. They are actively involved in their own investment decisions. They have clearly laid out long-term plans that will allow them to reach their financial objectives. They invest in their education before actually buying an investment. They take advantage of periodic investing and, whenever possible, invest in a tax-advantaged way. Most importantly, they seek out advice from competent financial planners. If you are not yet a long-term investor, get yourself there as fast as you can. What does this mean? This means that you sit down and map out a plan. Get control of your spending habits. Minimize your debt and liabilities. Live within your means and then increase your means. Find out how much invested per month for how many months at a realistic rate of return it will take to reach your goals. Goals such as, at what age do you plan to stop working? How much money will you need per month? Simply having a long-term plan that reduces your consumer debt while putting away a small amount of money on a periodic basis into a top mutual fund will give you a head start on retiring wealthy, if you start early enough, and keep an eye on what you're doing. At this level, keep it simple. Don't get fancy. Forget the sophisticated investments. Just do solid stock and mutual fund investments. Learn how to buy closed and mutual funds soon if you haven't already. Don't try to outsmart the market. Use insurance vehicles wisely as protection, but not as wealth accumulation. A mutual fund like the Vanguard Index 500 fund, which in the past has outperformed two-thirds of all mutual funds year in and year out, is worth using as a benchmark. Over 10 years, this type of fund may give you a return that exceeds 90% of the professional mutual fund money managers. 
But always remember, there is no 100% safe investment. Index funds have their own inherent tragic flaws. Stop waiting for the big deal. Get into the game with small deals, like my first small condo that allowed me to start investing for just a few dollars. Don't worry about being right or wrong at first. Just start. You'll learn a lot more once you put some money down. Just a little to start. Money has a way of increasing intelligence quickly. Fear and hesitation retards you. You can always move up to a bigger game, but you can never get back the time and education you lost by waiting to do the right thing or make the big deal. Remember, small deals often lead to bigger deals, but you must start. Start today. Don't wait. Reduce your credit card debt. Get rid of doodads and call a good no-load mutual fund, although there is no such thing as a true no-load fund. Sit down with your loved ones and work out a plan. Call a financial planner or go to the library and read about financial planning and start putting money away, even if it's only $50 a month for yourself. The longer you wait, the more you waste one of your most precious assets, the intangible and priceless asset of time. An interesting note. Level 4 is where most of the millionaires in America come from. For people who don't like risk and would rather focus on their profession or career instead of spending a lot of time studying the subject of investing, Level 4 is a must if you want to live a prosperous and financially abundant life. For these individuals, it is even more important to seek the advice of financial planners. They can help you develop your investment strategy and get you started on the right track with a long-term investing pattern. This level of investor is patient and uses the advantage of time. If you start early and invest regularly, you can make it to phenomenal wealth. If you start late in life, past age 45, this level may not work, especially between now and the year 2010. Level 5. Sophisticated Investors These investors can afford to seek more aggressive or risky investment strategies. Why? Because they have good money habits, a solid foundation of money, and also investment savvy. They are not new to the game. They are focused, not usually diversified. They have a long track record of winning on a consistent basis, and they've had enough losses that give them the wisdom that only comes from making mistakes and learning from them. These are the investors that often buy investments wholesale rather than retail. They put their own deals together for their own use. Or they are sophisticated enough to get into deals that their capitalist friends, the Level 6 group, have put together that need investment capital. What determines whether people are sophisticated? They have a financial base that is sound from their profession, business, or retirement income, or have a base of solid conservative investments. These people have their personal debt equity ratios in control, which means they have much more income than expenses. They are well educated in the world of investing and actively seek new information. They are cautious, yet not cynical, always keeping an open mind. They risk less than 20% of all their capital in speculative ventures. They often start small, putting a little money down so they can learn the business of investing, be it stocks, a business acquisition, a real estate syndication, buying foreclosures, etc. If they lost this 20%, it would not damage them or take food off their tables. They will look at the loss as a lesson, learn from it, and get back into the game to learn more, knowing that failure is part of the process of success. While hating to lose, they are not afraid of losing. If people are sophisticated, they can create their own deals with returns of 25% to infinity. They are classified as sophisticated because they have the extra money, a team of hand-picked professional advisors, and a track record to prove it. These investors know that bad economic times or markets offer them the best opportunities for success. They get into markets when others are getting out. They usually know when to get out. At this level, an exit strategy is more important than entry into the market. They are clear on their own principles and their rules of investing. Their vehicle of choice might be real estate, discounted paper, businesses, bankruptcies, or new issues of stocks. While they take risks greater than the average person, they abhor gambling. They have plans and specific goals. They study on a daily basis. They read the paper, read magazines, subscribe to investment newsletters, and attend investment seminars. They actively participate in the management of their investments. They understand money and know how to have money work for them. Their main focus is on increasing their assets, rather than investing so they can make a few extra bucks to spend. They reinvest their gains to build a bigger asset base. They know that building a strong asset base that throws off high cash yields or high returns with minimal tax exposure is the path to great long-term wealth. They often teach this information to their children and pass on the family fortune to the generations that follow in the form of corporations, trusts, and partnerships. They personally own little. Nothing is found in their names for tax purposes, as well as for protection from Robin Hoods who believe in taking from the rich to give to the poor. 
But although they own nothing, they control everything to corporations. They control the legal entities that own their assets. They have a personal board of directors to help them manage their assets. They take advice and learn. This informal board is comprised of a team of bankers, accountants, attorneys, and brokers. They spend a small fortune on solid professional advice, not only to increase their wealth, but also to protect their wealth from family, friends, lawsuits, and the government. Even after they have departed this life, they are still controlling their wealth. These people are often called stewards of money. Even after death, they continue to direct the fate of the money they created. Level 6. Capitalists. Few people in the world reach this level of investment excellence. In America, less than one person in a hundred is a true capitalist. This person is usually an excellent B as well as an I, because he or she can create a business and an investment opportunity simultaneously. A capitalist's purpose is to make more money by synergistically orchestrating other people's money, other people's talents, and other people's time. Often they are the movers and shakers that allow America and other great countries to become great financial powers. These are the Kennedys, Rockefellers, Fords, J. Paul Gettys, and Ross Perot's. It is the capitalists that provide the money that create the jobs, the businesses, and the goods that make a country prosper. Level 5 investors generally create investments only for their own portfolio using their own money. True capitalists, on the other hand, create investments for themselves and others by using the talents and finances of other people. True capitalists create investments and sell them to the market. True capitalists do not need money to make money, simply because they know how to use other people's money and other people's time. Level 6 investors create the investments that other people buy. They often make other people rich, create jobs, and make things happen. In good economic times, true capitalists do well. In bad economic times, true capitalists get even richer. Capitalists know that economic chaos means new opportunities. Returns of 100% to infinity are expected. That's because they know how to manage risk and how to make money without money. They can do this because they know that money is not a thing, but merely an idea created in their heads. While these people have the same fears everyone has, they use that fear and turn it into excitement. They convert fear into new knowledge and new wealth. Their game in life is the game of money making money. They love the game of money more than any other game. That's what makes them capitalists. If you are truly sincere about getting wealthy quickly, then you need to understand these seven levels of investors. Each time you think about your investments, recognize your strengths and weaknesses. Do everything to understand and improve yourself. Only by identifying what is holding you back will you be on your path to reaching your goal of financial freedom. You cannot see money with your eyes. In late 1974, I purchased a small condominium on the fringes of Waikiki as one of my first investment properties. The price was $56,000 for a cute two-bedroom, one-bath unit in an average building. It was a perfect rental unit, and I knew it would rent quickly. I drove over to my rich dad's office, all excited about showing him the deal. He glanced at the documents, and in less than a minute he looked up and asked, How much money are you losing a month? About a hundred dollars a month, I said. Don't be foolish, rich dad said. I haven't gone over the numbers, but I can already tell from the written documents that you're losing much more than that. And besides, why in the world would you knowingly invest in something that loses money? Well, the unit looked nice, and I thought it was a good deal. A little paint and the place would be as good as new, I said. That doesn't justify knowingly losing money, smirked Rich Dad. Well, my real estate agent said not to worry about losing money every month. He said that in a few years the price of this unit will double, and in addition, the government gives me a tax break on the money I lose. Besides, it was such a good deal that I was afraid someone else would buy it if I didn't. Rich Dad shook his head as he scanned the documents. On that day, I learned more about money and investing than I had in all my previous 27 years of life. Rich Dad was happy that I'd taken the initiative and invested in a property, but I'd made some grave mistakes that could have been a financial disaster. However, the lessons I learned from that one investment have made me millions over the years. It's not what your eyes see, said Rich Dad. A piece of real estate is a piece of real estate. A company stock certificate is a company stock certificate. You can see those things. But it's what you cannot see that is important. It's the deal, the financial agreement, the market, the management, the risk factors, the cash flow, the tax laws, and a thousand other things that make something a good investment or not. He then proceeded to tear the deal apart with questions. Why would you pay such a high interest rate? What do you figure your return on the investment to be? 
How does this investment fit into your long-term financial strategy? What vacancy factor are you using? Have you figured in management costs? What percentage rate did you use to compute repairs? Did you know that the city has just announced it will be tearing up the roads in that area and changing the traffic pattern? A major thoroughfare will run right in front of your building. Residents are moving to avoid the year-long project. Did you know that? I know the market trend is up today, but do you know what is driving that trend? What happens if this place is not rented? And if it isn't, how long can you keep it afloat and yourself afloat? And again, what goes on in your head to make you think that losing money is a good deal? This really has me worried. It looked like a good deal, I said, deflated. Rich Dad smiled. I'm glad you took action, he said. Most people think, but never do. If you do something, you make mistakes. And it's from our mistakes that we learn the most. Remember that anything important cannot be really learned in the classroom. It must be learned by taking action, making mistakes, and then correcting them. That is when wisdom sets in. I felt a little better, and now I was ready to learn. Most people, said Rich Dad, invest 95% with their eyes and only 5% with their minds. Rich Dad went on to explain that people look at a piece of real estate or the name of a stock and often make their decision based on what their eyes see or what a broker tells them or on a hot tip from a fellow worker. They often buy emotionally instead of rationally. That is why nine out of ten investors do not make money, said Rich Dad. While they do not necessarily lose money, they just do not make money. They just break even, making some and losing some. That's because they invest with their eyes and emotions rather than with their minds. Let's go back over this losing deal you just bought. Now we'll teach you how to turn it into a winning deal. I'll begin to teach your mind to see what your eyes cannot. The next morning, I went back to the real estate agent, rejected the agreement, and reopened negotiation. It was not a pleasant process, but I learned a lot. Three days later, I returned to see my rich dad. The price had stayed the same. The agent got his full commission because he deserved it. But the terms of the investment were very different. By renegotiating the interest rate, payment terms, and the amortization period, instead of losing money, I was now certain of making a net profit of $80 per month, even after the management fee and an allowance for vacancy was factored in. I could even lower my rent and still make money if the market went bad. I would definitely raise the rent if the market got better. I estimated that you were going to lose at least $150 per month, said Rich Dad, probably more. If you had continued to lose $150 per month, based on salary and expenses. How many of these deals could you afford? Barely one, I replied. Most months, I do not have an extra $150. If I had done the original deal, I would have struggled financially every month, even after the tax breaks. I might have even had to take an extra job to pay for this investment. And now, how many of these deals at $80 positive cash flow can you afford? Asked Rich Dad. I smiled and said, as many as I can get my hands on. Rich Dad nodded in approval. Now go out there and get your hands on more of them. A few years later, the real estate prices in Hawaii did skyrocket. But instead of having only one property go up in value, I had seven double in value. That is the power of a little financial intelligence. As my rich dad has said, the average person is 95% eyes and only 5% mind when they invest. If you want to become a professional on the B and I side of the quadrant, you need to train your eyes to see only 5% and your mind to see the other 95%. Rich Dad went on to explain that people who trained their minds to see money had tremendous power over people who did not. Train your brain to see money. So what is the first step in training your brain to see money? The answer is financial literacy. It begins with the ability to understand the words and the number systems of capitalism. The second step in training your brain to see money is to learn to recognize what real risk is. When people say to me that investing is risky, I simply say, investing is not risky. Being uneducated is risky. Investing is much like flying. If you've been to flight school and spent a number of years gaining experience, then flying is fun and exciting. But if you've never been to flight school, I would recommend leaving the flying to someone else. Bad advice is risky. Rich Dad firmly believed that any financial advice was better than no financial advice. He was a man with an open mind. He was courteous and listened to many people. But ultimately, he relied on his own financial intelligence to make his decisions. Rich Dad also said, Your advisors can only be as smart as you are. If you are not smart, they cannot tell you that much. If you are financially well-educated, competent advisors can give you more sophisticated financial advice. If you are financially naive, they must by law offer you only safe and secure financial strategies. If you are an unsophisticated investor, they can only offer low-risk, low-yield investments. 
They'll often recommend diversification for unsophisticated investors. Few advisors choose to take the time to teach you. Their time is also money. So if you will take it upon yourself to become financially educated and manage your money well, then a competent advisor can inform you about investments and strategies that only a few will ever see. But first, you must do your part to get educated. Is your banker lying to you? Rich Dad had several bankers he dealt with. They were an important part of his financial team. While he was close friends with and respected his bankers, he always felt that he had to watch out for his own best interests, as he expected the bankers to look out for their own best interests. After my 1974 investment experience, he asked me this: When bankers say that your house is an asset, are they telling you the truth? Since most people are not financially literate and do not know the game of money, they often must take the opinion and advice of people they tend to trust. If you are not financially literate, then you need to trust someone you hope is financially literate. Many people invest or manage their money based on someone else's recommendations more than their own, and that is risky. The fact is, when bankers tell you your house is an asset, they're not really lying to you. They're just not telling you the whole truth. While your house is an asset, they simply do not say whose asset it is. For if you read financial statements, it is easy to see that your house is not your asset; it's the bank's asset. My rich dad's definitions of an asset and a liability are: an asset puts money into my pocket; a liability takes money out of my pocket. People on the left side of the quadrant do not really need to know the difference. Most of them are happy to feel secure in their jobs, have a nice house that they think they own, they feel proud of, and think they are in control of. Nobody will take it away from them as long as they make those payments, and make those payments they do. But people on the right side of the quadrant need to know the difference. To be financially literate and financially intelligent means being able to understand the big picture of money. Financially astute people know that your mortgage does not show up as an asset, but as a liability on your balance sheet. It shows up as an asset on the bank's balance sheet, not yours. That's B and I accounting. In accounting, you would show the value of your home as an asset and the mortgage as a liability. Also, an important point to note is that the value of your home is an opinion which fluctuates with the market, while your mortgage is a definite liability not affected by the market. For B and I accounting, however, the value of your home is not considered an asset because it does not generate cash flow. Many people ask me, "What happens if I pay off my mortgage? Is my house an asset then?" And my reply is, in most cases, the answer is still no. It's still a liability. There are several reasons for my answer. One is maintenance and general upkeep. Even if you own it free and clear, it still costs you money for repairs with after-tax dollars. A person in the B and I quadrants only includes property as an asset if it generates income through positive cash flow. But the main reason a house, even without a mortgage, is still a liability is because you still do not own it, really. The government still taxes you even if you own it. Just stop paying your property taxes, and again you'll find out who really owns your property. What is your interest rate really? Rich Dad fought and negotiated tough for every single point of interest he paid. He asked me this question: When a banker tells you your interest rate is eight percent per annum, is it really? I found out it's not if you learn to read numbers. Let's say you buy a one hundred thousand dollar home, make a down payment of twenty thousand dollars, and borrow the remaining eighty thousand dollars at eight percent interest with a thirty-year term from your bank. In five years, you will pay a total of thirty-five thousand two hundred twenty dollars to the bank. Thirty-one thousand two hundred seventy-six dollars for interest, and only three thousand nine hundred forty-four dollars for debt reduction. If you take the loan to term for thirty years, you will have paid two hundred eleven thousand three hundred twenty-three dollars total principal and interest, less what you originally borrowed, eighty thousand dollars. The total interest you will have paid, a hundred thirty-one thousand three hundred twenty-three dollars. By the way, that two hundred eleven thousand three hundred twenty-three dollars does not include property taxes and insurance on the loan. Funny. Hundred thirty-one thousand three hundred twenty-three dollars seems to be a little bit more than eight percent of eighty thousand dollars. It's more like a hundred sixty percent in interest over thirty years. As I said, they're not lying; they are just not telling you the whole truth. And if you cannot read numbers, you'd really never know. In the banking industry, a seven-year average is used as the life expectancy for a mortgage. That means banks expect the average person to buy a new house or refinance every seven years. And that means, in this example, they expect to get their original eighty thousand dollars back every seven years, plus forty-three thousand two hundred ninety-one dollars in interest. And that's why it is called a mortgage, which comes from the French word mortir, or agreement until death.
The reality is that most people will continue to work hard, get pay raises, and buy new houses with new mortgages. On top of that, the government gives a tax break to encourage taxpayers to buy more expensive houses, which will mean higher property taxes for the government. And let's not forget the insurance that every mortgage company requires you to pay on your mortgage. Every time I watch television, I see commercials where professional baseball and football players smile and tell you to take all your credit card debt and roll it into a bill consolidation loan. That way, you can pay off all those credit cards and carry a new loan at a lower interest rate. Then they tell you why it's financially intelligent to do this. A bill consolidation loan is a smart move on your part because the government will give you a tax deduction for the interest payments you make on your home mortgage. Viewers, thinking they see the light, run down to their finance company, refinance their houses, pay off their credit cards, and feel intelligent. A few weeks later, they're shopping and see a new dress, realize their kid needs a new bicycle, or they need to take a vacation because they're exhausted. They just happen to now have a clean credit card, or they suddenly receive a new credit card in the mail because they paid off the other. They have excellent credit. They pay their bills, and their little heart goes pitter pat, and they say to themselves, "Oh, go on, you deserve it. You can pay it off a little every month." Emotions overpower logic, and the clean new credit card comes out of hiding. What about savings? Are they assets? Now your savings really are assets. That's the good news. But again, if you read financial statements, you will see the total picture. While it is true that your savings and checkbook balance show up in the asset column of your balance sheet, they are carried on your bank's balance sheet as liabilities. Why is your savings and checkbook balance a liability to banks? They have to pay you interest for your money, and it costs them money to safeguard it. You get a tax break for buying a house and going into debt, but you do not get a tax break for saving money. Have you ever wondered why? I do not have the exact answer, but I can speculate. One big reason is because your savings are a liability to banks. Why would they ask the government to pass a law that would encourage you to put money in their bank, money that would be a liability to them? Banks really do not need your savings. They don't need much in deposits because they can magnify money at least ten times. If you put a single one-dollar note in the bank by law, the bank can lend out ten dollars, and depending on the reserve limits imposed by the central bank, possibly as much as twenty dollars. That means your single one dollar suddenly becomes ten dollars or more. It's magic. On top of that, the bank might pay you only five percent interest on that one dollar. You, as a consumer, feel secure because the bank is paying you some money on your money. Banks see this as good customer relations because if you have savings with them, you may come in and borrow from them. They want you to borrow because they can then charge nine percent or more to you on what you borrow. While you may make five percent on your one dollar, the bank can make nine percent or more on the ten dollars of debt your single dollar has generated. Recently, I received a new credit card that advertised eight point nine percent interest, but if you understood the legal jargon in the fine print, it was really twenty three percent. Needless to say, that credit card was cut in half and mailed back. In 1974, my rich dad was upset because the game was played against me, and I did not know it. I had bought this investment and had taken a losing position, yet I had been led to believe it was a winning position. Rich dad then explained the basics of the game. The name of the game of capitalism is who is indebted to whom. Once I knew the game, he said, then I could be a better player, instead of someone who just had the game run all over him. The more people you are indebted to, the poorer you are, said rich dad. And the more people you have indebted to you, the wealthier you are. That is the game. We are all in debt to someone else. The problems occur when the debt gets out of balance. If you are going to play the game, then you had best learn the game, know the rules, speak the same language, and know with whom you're playing. Rich Dad drew the cash flow quadrant. He asked, "If you're going to play the money game, which team do you want to be on? The E's, S's, B's, or I's? Or which side of the court do you want to be on? The right side or the left?" I pointed to the right side of the quadrant. Good," said Rich Dad. "That is why you can't go out there to play the game and believe some sales agent when he tells you that to lose a hundred fifty dollars a month for thirty years is a good deal, because the government will give you a tax break for losing money, and he expects the price of real estate to go up. 
You simply cannot play the game with that mindset. While those opinions might come true, that is just not the way the game is played on the right side of the quadrant. Somebody is telling you to get into debt, take all the risks, and pay for it. People on the left side think that is a good idea, but not the people on the right. Look at it my way," said Rich Dad. "You're willing to pay fifty-six thousand dollars for this condo in the sky. You're signing for the debt. You take the risk. The tenant pays less in rent than what it costs to live there, so you are subsidizing that person's housing. Does that make sense to you?" I shook my head. No. This is the way I play the game," said Rich Dad. "From now on, if you take on debt and risk, then you should get paid. Got that?" I nodded my head. "Making money is common sense," said Rich Dad. "It's not rocket science." But unfortunately, when it comes to money, common sense is uncommon. It was then that Rich Dad gave me an important rule that he has always used: your profit is made when you buy, not when you sell. Rich Dad had to be certain that whatever debt or risk he took on, it had to make sense from the day he bought it. It had to make sense if the economy got worse, and it had to make sense if the economy got better. He never bought on tax tricks or crystal ball forecasts of the future. A deal had to make sound economic sense in good times and in bad. I was beginning to understand the game of money as he saw it, and the game of money was to see others become indebted to you and to be careful to whom you became indebted. Today I still hear his words: If you take on risk and debt, make sure you get paid for it. Rich Dad had debt, but he was careful when he took it on. If you take on debt personally, make sure it's small. If you take on large debt, make sure someone else is paying for it. The importance of facts versus opinions. Rich Dad continued his lesson. If you want to be successful on the right side, when it comes to money, you've got to know the difference between facts and opinions. You cannot blindly accept financial advice the way people on the left side do. You must know the numbers. You must know the facts, and numbers tell you the facts. Your financial survival depends upon facts, not some friend or advisor's wordy opinions. Most people struggle financially because they spend their lives using opinions rather than facts when making financial decisions. Opinions such as "your house is an asset," "the price of real estate always goes up," "it takes money to make money," "you should diversify your portfolio," "you have to be dishonest to be rich," "investing is risky," "play it safe." The point is, most people's lives are determined by their opinions rather than the facts. For a person's life to change, they first need to change their opinions. Then start looking at the facts. If you can read financial statements, you will be able to see the facts not only of a company's financial success. If you can read financial statements, you can tell immediately how an individual is doing, rather than going by your or somebody else's opinions. One is not better than the other, but to be successful in life, especially financially, you must know the difference. If you cannot verify something is a fact, then it is an opinion. Financial blindness is when people cannot read numbers. So they must take someone else's opinion. Financial insanity is caused when opinions are used as facts. If you want to be on the right side of the quadrant, you must know the difference between facts and opinions. Few lessons are more important than this one. I sat there listening quietly, doing my best to understand what he was saying. Do you know what due diligence means? Rich Dad asked. I shook my head. Due diligence simply means finding out what are opinions and what are facts. When it comes to money, most people are either lazy or searching for shortcuts, so they do not do enough due diligence. And there are still others who are so afraid of making mistakes that all they do is due diligence and then do nothing. Too much due diligence is also called analysis paralysis. The point is, you must know how to sift through the facts and opinions, then make your decision. Most people are in financial trouble today simply because they've taken too many shortcuts and are making life's financial decisions based upon opinions. The opinions of an E employee or an S self-employed, and not on the facts. If you want to be a B business owner or an I investor, you must be keenly aware of the difference. Learning the game of money and how it is played is an important part of your journey to financial freedom. More important, though, is whom you need to become to move to the right side of the cash flow quadrant. We can be anything we want. Most of us have the potential to be successful in all of the quadrants. It all depends on how determined we are to be successful, as my rich dad said. Passion builds businesses, not fear. The problem with changing quadrants is often in our past conditioning. Many of us came from families where the emotion of fear was used as a prime motivator to get us to think and act in a certain way. For example, how often have you heard, "If you don't get good grades, you won't get a safe, secure job with benefits"? 
Well, today many people have gotten good grades, but there are fewer safe, secure jobs and even fewer with benefits, like retirement plans. So many people, even those with good grades, need to mind their own business and not just look for a job where they will mind someone else's business. How do I get rich? When I'm asked, where did I learn my formula for getting rich? I reply, playing the game of Monopoly as a kid. Some people think I'm kidding, and others wait for the punchline, expecting a joke. Yet it is not meant as a joke, and I'm not kidding. The formula for getting rich in Monopoly is simple, and it works in real life as well as in the game. Four greenhouses, one red hotel. You may recall that the secret to wealth when playing Monopoly is simply to buy four greenhouses and then trade them in to buy a large red hotel. That is all it takes, and that is the same investment formula for wealth my wife and I used. When the real estate market was really bad, we bought as many small houses as we could with the limited money we had. When the market improved, we traded in the four greenhouses and bought a large red hotel. We never have to work because the cash flow from our large red hotel, apartment houses, and mini storages pays for our lifestyle. Doing what rich people do is easy. One of the reasons there are so many wealthy people who did not do well in school is because the to-do part of becoming wealthy is simple. There is a classic book I recommend you read, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. I read this book as a youngster, and it greatly influenced the direction of my life. In fact, it was my rich dad who first recommended that I read this book, and others like it. There is a good reason why it's titled Think and Grow Rich and not Work Hard and Grow Rich or Get a Job and Grow Rich. The fact is, people who work the hardest do not wind up rich. If you want to be rich, you need to think. Think independently rather than go along with the crowd. In my opinion, one great asset of the rich is that they think differently from everyone else. If you do what everyone else does, you'll wind up having what everyone else has. And for most people, what they have is years of hard work, unfair taxes, and a lifetime of debt. When someone asks me, what do I have to do to move from the left side of the quadrant to the right side? My response is, it's not what you have to do that needs to change. It's first how you think that needs to change. In other words, it's who you have to be in order to do what needs to be done. Years ago, I was in a class on goal setting. It was the mid-1970s, and I really could not believe I was spending $150 in a beautiful Saturday and Sunday to learn how to set goals. I would rather have been surfing. Instead, here I was paying someone to teach me how to set goals. I nearly backed out several times. But what I learned from that class has helped me achieve what I want in life. The instructor put up on the board these three words. Be. Do. Have. She then said, Goals are the have part of these three words. Once most people figure out what they want to have, their goal, they begin listing what they have to do. That is why most people have to-do lists. They set their goal and then begin doing. She discussed investments, saying, Many people think that buying stocks or mutual funds will make them rich. Well, simply buying stocks, mutual funds, real estate, and bonds will not make you rich. Just doing what professional investors do does not guarantee financial success. People who have a loser mentality will always lose, no matter what stock, bond, real estate, or mutual fund they buy. Next, she used an example of finding the perfect romantic partner. So many people go to bars or to work or to their church looking for the perfect person. That is what they do. What they do is go and look for the right person instead of working on being the right person. Here's one of her examples about relationships. In marriage, many people try to change the other person so they can have a better marriage. Instead of trying to change the other person, which often leads to fights, it is better to change yourself first, she said. Don't work on the other person. Work on your thoughts about the other person. As she was talking about relationships, my mind drifted to the many people I had met over the years who were out to change the world, but were not getting anywhere. They wanted to change everyone else, but not change themselves. And when it comes to money, she said, many people try to do what the rich do and to have what the rich have. So they go out and buy a house that looks rich, a car that looks rich, and send their kids to the schools where the rich send their kids. All this does is cause these people to do by working harder and to have more debt, which causes them to work even harder, which is not what the truly rich do. My rich dad did not use these same words, but he did often say to me, people think that working hard for money and then buying things that make them look rich will make them rich. In most cases, it doesn't. It only makes them more tired. They call it keeping up with the Joneses, and if you notice, the Joneses are exhausted. During that weekend class, much of what my rich dad had been telling me began to make more sense. For years he lived modestly. 
Instead of working hard to pay bills, he worked hard to acquire assets. If you saw him on the street, he looked like everyone else. He drove a pickup truck, not an expensive car. Then, one day, when he was in his late thirties, he emerged as a financial powerhouse. People took notice when he suddenly bought one of the prime pieces of real estate in Hawaii. After his name hit the paper, it was then people realized that this quiet, unpretentious man owned many other businesses, lots of prime real estate, and when he spoke, his bankers listened. Few people ever saw the modest house he lived in. After he was flush with cash and cash flow from his assets, he then bought a new large house for his family. He did not take out a loan. He paid cash. After that weekend class on goal setting, I realized that many people tried doing what they thought the rich did and tried having what the rich had. They often would buy big houses and invest in the stock market because that is what they thought the rich did. Yet what my rich dad was trying to tell me was, if they still thought and had the same beliefs and ideas of a poor person or middle class person, then did what the rich did, they would still wind up having what the poor and middle class have. Be, do, have began to make sense. Rich Dad's cash flow quadrant is about being, not doing. Moving from the left side of the quadrant to the right side of the quadrant is not so much about doing, but more about being. The good news is that it does not cost much money to change your thinking. In fact, it can be done for free. The bad news is that sometimes it's hard to change some deep core thoughts about money that are handed down from generation to generation, or thoughts that you learn from friends, from work, and from school. Yet it can be done. And this is what this recording is primarily about. It's not so much a how-to book on what to do to become financially free. It's not about what stocks to buy or what mutual fund is safest. This program is primarily about strengthening your thoughts, being, so that you can take the action, doing, that will enable you to become financially free, having. For people contemplating making the crossing from one quadrant to another. An important part of the process is to be aware of your internal dialogue, or conversations within you, and always remember that what sounds logical in one quadrant does not make sense in another quadrant. The process of going from job or financial security to financial freedom is primarily a process of changing your thinking. It is a process of doing your best to know which thoughts are emotion-based and which thoughts are logic-based. If you can keep your emotions in check. And go for what you know to be logical. You have a good chance of making the journey. No matter what anyone is saying to you from the outside, the most important conversation is the one you are having with yourself on the inside. That is why my rich dad forbade me from saying, "I can't afford it. I can't do that. Play it safe. Don't lose money." Rich dad firmly believed that what we said to ourselves at our core became our reality. That is why I suspect that for people who struggle financially, their emotions often do the talking and run their lives. If they are emotionally based thoughts, they are powerful. The good news is that they can be changed with the support of new friends, new ideas, and a little time. People who are not able to control their fear of losing should never invest on their own. They are best served by turning that job over to professionals and not interfering with them. As an interesting note, I have met many professional people who are fearless when investing other people's money and able to make lots of money. But when it comes to investing or risking their own money. Their fear of losing becomes too strong, and they ultimately lose. Their emotions do the thinking rather than their logic. I have also met people who can invest their money and win constantly, but lose their calm when other people ask them to invest money for them. The making and losing of money is an emotional subject. Rich Dad always said, "To be successful as an investor or business owner, you have to be emotionally neutral to winning and losing. Winning and losing are just part of the game." The laws. Understanding the laws and market forces is vital to financial success. Great transfers of wealth often occur when laws and markets change, so it is important to pay attention if you want to have those changes work in your favor and not against you. We are entering an era of tremendous change and opportunity. For some people, it will be the best of times, and for others, it will be the worst of times. Education is more important than ever before. But we need to teach people to think a little further than just looking for a secure job and expecting the company or the government to look after them once their working days are through. That is an industrial age idea, and we aren't there anymore. The rules have changed. One advantage of living in a free society is the freedom to make choices. In my opinion, there are two big choices: the choice of security and the choice of freedom. If you choose security. There is a huge price to pay for that security in the form of excessive taxes and punishing interest payments. If you choose freedom, then you need to learn the whole game and then play the game. 
It is your choice from which quadrant you want to play the game. In 1943, the U.S. began taxing all working Americans via payroll deduction. In other words, the government got paid before people in the E, employee quadrant, got paid. Anyone who was purely an E had little escape from the government. It also meant that instead of only the rich being taxed, which was the hope of the 16th Amendment, it now meant everyone on the left side of the quadrant got taxed, rich or poor. But the lowest paid in America today pay more in taxes as a percentage of total income than the rich and the middle class. In 1986, the Tax Reform Act went after the highly paid professionals in the S quadrant. The act specifically listed doctors, lawyers, architects, dentists, engineers, and other such professions and made it difficult, if not impossible, for them to shelter their income the way the rich can do in the B and I quadrants. These professionals were forced to operate their businesses through S corporations instead of through C corporations or pay a tax penalty. Income for these highly compensated professionals is then passed through the S corporation and taxed at the highest individual tax rate possible. They don't have the opportunity to shelter their income through deductions allowed to a C corporation. And at the same time, the law was changed to force all S corporations to have a calendar year end. This again forced all income to be taxed at the highest rate. When I was discussing these changes recently with my personal CPA, she reminded me that the biggest shock to newly self-employed people generally comes at the end of their first year when they realize that the biggest tax they are paying is a self-employment tax. This tax is double for the S's over what they paid as E's, and it is calculated on income before the individual can deduct any itemized deductions or personal exemptions. It is possible for a self-employed person to have no taxable income, yet still owe self-employment tax. Corporations, on the other hand, do not pay self-employment tax. The 1986 Tax Reform Act also effectively pushed the E's and S's of America out of real estate as an investment and into paper assets, such as stocks and mutual funds, basing their future financial well-being upon paper assets subject to the ups and downs of the market. After the 1986 Tax Reform Act, the rich continue to earn more, work less, pay less taxes, and enjoy greater asset protection by using the formula my rich dad gave me 40 years ago. Build a business and buy real estate. Make a lot of money via C corporations and shelter your income through real estate. While millions upon millions of Americans work, pay more and more taxes, and then pour billions each month into mutual funds, the rich are quietly selling the shares of their C corporations, making them even richer, and then buying billions in investment real estate. As we progress further and further away from the industrial age and into the information age, we all need to continue to gather information from different quadrants. In the information age, quality information is our most important asset. As Eric Hoffer once said, in times of change, learners inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. Remember that everyone's financial situation is different. That is why I always recommend that you seek out the best professional and financial advice you can find. For example, while a C corporation may work well in some instances, it does not work well in all instances. Even on the right side of the quadrant, occasionally an S corporation is appropriate. Also, remember that there are different advisors for the rich, the poor, and the middle class, just as there are different advisors for people who earn their money on the right side and on the left. Also consider seeking advice from people who already are where you want to go. Never do business or investing for tax reasons. A tax break is an extra bonus for doing things the way the government wants. It should be a bonus, not the reason. And if you are not a U.S. citizen, this advice remains the same. Our laws may be different, yet the principles of seeking competent advice remain the same. People on the right side operate very similarly throughout the world. How to become a successful business owner and investor. Most of us have heard the saying, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. I would like to modify that statement a little. Instead, I would say, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a baby step. I emphasize this because I have seen too many people attempt to take the great leap forward instead of taking baby steps. Long-term financial success is not measured in how big your stride is. Long-term financial success is measured in the number of steps, in which direction you're moving, and in numbers of years. In reality, that is the formula for success or failure in any endeavor. When it comes to money, I have seen too many people, myself included, attempt to do too much with too little, and then crash and burn. In other words, you go from baby steps to walking and then to running. This is the path I recommend. 
For people who want to be successful in the information age, the faster they begin to develop their financial intelligence and emotional intelligence, the faster they will feel more financially secure and find financial freedom. Today, when people say, don't work hard, work smart, they do not mean work smart in the E or S quadrants. They actually mean working smart in the B or I quadrants. That is information age thinking which is why financial intelligence and emotional intelligence are so vital today and will be vital in the future. So what is the answer? Obviously, my answer is to re-educate yourself like a rich person, not a poor or middle-class person. In other words, to think and look at the world from the B or I quadrant. However, the solution is not as simple as going back to school and taking a few courses. To be successful in the B or I quadrant requires financial intelligence, systems intelligence, and emotional intelligence. These things cannot be learned in school. The reason these intelligences are hard to learn is because most adults are wired to the hard work and spend mode of life. They feel financial anxiety, so they hurry off to work and work hard. They come home and hear about the stock market going up and down. The anxiety grows, so they go shopping for a new house or car, or they go and play golf to avoid the anxiety. The problem is that the anxiety returns on Monday morning. People often ask me how to get started thinking like a rich person. I always recommend starting small and seeking education. If people are serious about learning and retraining themselves to think like a rich person, I recommend my patented board game, Cash Flow. I created the game to help people improve their financial intelligence. It gives people the mental, physical, and emotional training required to allow them to make the gradual change from thinking like a poor or middle class person to thinking like a rich person. Cash flow, not money, relieves anxiety. Financial struggle and poverty are really financial anxiety problems. They are mental and emotional loops that keep people stuck in what I call the rat race. Unless the mental and emotional hooks are broken, the pattern remains intact. I worked with a banker a few months ago on breaking his pattern of financial struggle. I'm not a therapist, but I have had experience in breaking my own financial habits instilled by my family. The banker makes more than $120,000 a year, but is always in some sort of financial trouble. He has a beautiful family, three cars, a big house, a vacation home, and he looks the part of a prosperous banker. When I looked at his financial statement, however, I found he had a financial cancer that would be terminal in a few years if he did not change his ways. The first time he and his wife played cash flow, he struggled and fidgeted almost uncontrollably. His mind was wandering, and he could not seem to grasp the game. After four hours of play, he was stuck. Everyone else had completed the game, but he was still in the rat race. So I asked him as we put the game away what was going on. His only answer was that the game was too hard, too slow, and too boring. I then reminded him of what I had told him before the game started, that all games are reflections of the people playing. In other words, a game is like a mirror that allows you to look at yourself. That statement angered him, so I backed off, and I asked if he was still committed to getting his financial life in order. He said he was still committed, so I invited him and his wife, who loved the game, to come and play again with an investment group I was coaching. A week later, he showed up, reluctantly. This time, a few lights began to go on inside his head. He still did not finish the game after four hours, but he was beginning to learn. As he left this time, he invited himself back. By the third meeting, he was a new man. He was now in control of the game, his accounting, and his investments. His confidence soared and this time he successfully exited the rat race and was on the fast track. This time, as he left, he purchased a game and said, I'm going to teach my kids. By the fourth meeting, he told me his own personal expenses were down, he had changed his spending habits and cut up several credit cards, and he was now taking an active interest in learning to invest and build his asset column. His thinking was now on track to make him an information age thinker. By the fifth meeting, he purchased Cash Flow 202, which is the advanced game for people who have mastered the original Cash Flow 101. He was now reading and eager to play the fast and risky game that true B's and I's play. The best news is that he had taken control of his financial future. He had re-educated himself not only mentally, but also, more importantly, emotionally, via the power of the repetitive learning process that comes from a game. The Seven Steps to Finding Your Financial Fast Track in step one, you need to mind your own business. Gather together your financial data, including your income, your expenses, your assets, and your liabilities. Get organized using a computer spreadsheet or just a simple piece of paper. By looking at your financial data, you can easily begin to see how you've been programmed from an early age to mind everyone else's business and ignore your own. Remember, 
Your liabilities are your banker's business, while your assets are yours. In order to get where you want to go, you need to know where you are. This is the first step to take control of your life and spend more time minding your own business. Next, set financial goals. Set a long-term financial goal for where you want to be in five years, and a smaller, short-term financial goal for where you want to be in 12 months. The smaller goal is a stepping stone along the way to your five-year goal. Be sure your goals are realistic and attainable. For instance, try to cut your debt by a specific amount while increasing your cash flow from assets or passive income. When you establish your five-year financial goals, do the same thing but take the long view. Now that you know where you are financially today and have set your goals, you need to get control of your cash flow so that you can achieve your goals. Step 2. Take control of your cash flow. After deciding to mind your own business, the next step as the CEO of the business of your life is to take control of your cash flow. The primary reason most people have money problems is that they were never schooled in the science of cash flow management. People work very hard thinking that more money will solve their financial problems. But as my rich dad often said, more money will not solve the problem if cash flow management is the problem. When you review your financial statements, determine which quadrant of the cash flow quadrant you receive your income from today. Then, determine which quadrant you want to receive the bulk of your income from in five years. At this point, you can begin establishing your cash flow management plan. Here are some rules. Pay yourself first. Put aside a set percentage from each paycheck or each payment you receive from other sources. Deposit that money into an investment savings account. Once your money goes into the account, never take it out until you are ready to invest it. Also, focus on reducing your personal debt. If you have credit cards with outstanding balances, cut up all your credit cards except for one or two. Any new charges you add to the one or two cards you now have must be paid off every month. Do not incur any further long-term debt. Then come up with $150 to $200 extra per month. Now that you're becoming more and more financially literate, this should be relatively easy to do. If you cannot generate an additional $150 to $200 per month, then your chances for financial freedom may only be a pipe dream. You will now pay the minimum plus the $150 to $200 on that one credit card. Pay only the minimum amount due on all other credit cards. Once the first card is paid off, then apply the total amount you are paying each month on that card to your next credit card. You are now paying the minimum amount due on the second card plus the total monthly payment you are paying on your first credit card. Continue this process with all your credit cards and other consumer credit, such as store charges, etc. With each debt you pay off, apply the full amount you are paying on that debt to the minimum payment of your next debt. As you pay off each debt, the monthly amount you are now paying on the next debt will escalate. Once all your credit cards and other consumer debt is paid off, continue the procedure with your car and house payments. If you follow this procedure, you will be amazed at the shortened amount of time it takes for you to be completely debt-free. Most people can be debt-free within five to seven years. Now that you are completely debt-free, take the monthly amount you are paying on your last debt and put that money towards investments. Build your asset column. That's how simple it is. Step 3. Know the difference between risk and risky. I often hear people saying investing is risky. I disagree. Instead, I say, being uneducated is risky. To my rich dad, to spend your life working hard for money only to have it go out as fast as it comes in is not a sign of high intelligence. Due to the lack of financial intelligence, many educated people will put themselves into positions of high financial risk. My rich dad called it financial redline, meaning income and expenses are nearly the same every month. These are the people who cling desperately to job security, are unable to change when the economy changes, and often destroy their health with stress and worry. And these are often the same people who say, business and investing is risky. In my opinion, business and investing is not risky. Being undereducated is. Similarly, being misinformed is risky, and relying on a safe, secure job is the highest risk anyone can take. Buying an asset is not risky. Buying liabilities you have been told are assets is risky. Minding your own business is not risky. Minding everyone else's business and paying them first is risky. Step 4. Decide what kind of investor you want to be. Most people struggle financially because they avoid financial problems. One of the biggest secrets my rich dad taught me was that if you want to acquire great wealth quickly, take on great financial problems. In addition to the seven levels of investors, I would like to add one more distinction that defines the three different types of investors. 
There are Type A, or investors who seek problems. Then there are Type B, or investors who seek answers. Finally, there are Type C, or what I call Sergeant Schultz investors. I know nothing. Let me address these types of investors in reverse order. Type C investors. The name Sergeant Schultz comes from the lovable character in the TV series Hogan's Heroes. When he knows something is wrong, all Schultz says is, I know nothing. Most people, when it comes to investing, take the same attitude. Can Sergeant Schultz investors still achieve great wealth? The answer is yes. They can get a job with the federal government, marry someone rich, or win the lottery. Type B investors often ask such questions as, What do you recommend I invest in? Do you think I should buy real estate? What mutual funds are good for me? Type B investors should immediately interview several financial planners, choose one, and start taking their advice. Financial planners, if they're good, provide excellent technical knowledge and can often help you establish a financial game plan for your life. Type A investors look for problems. In particular, they look for problems caused by those who get into financial trouble. Investors who are good at solving problems expect to make returns of 25% to infinity on their money. They are typically level 5 and level 6 investors who have strong financial foundations. Can you be all three types of investors? In reality, I operate as all three types of investors. I am a Sergeant Schultz or a Type C investor when it comes to mutual funds or picking stocks. I do have a few mutual funds, but I really do not spend much time studying them. I can achieve better results with my apartment houses than with mutual funds. As a Type B investor, I seek professional answers to my financial problems. I seek answers from financial planners, stockbrokers, bankers, and real estate brokers. They are closer to the market and are, I trust, more up to date with changes in the laws and the markets. The advice of my financial planner is priceless simply because she knows trusts, wills, and insurance far better than I ever will. Everyone should have a plan. There was much more to investing than simply buying and selling. Years ago, my rich dad encouraged me to develop my skills as a business owner and investor. He also said, then practice solving problems. For years, that is all I've done. I know that inside of every problem lies an opportunity, and opportunities are what real investors are after. Step 5. Seek mentors. Mentors tell us what is important. Find somebody who's been there and choose your mentors wisely. My highly educated but poor dad thought that a job with a high salary was important and that buying the house of your dreams was important. He also believed in paying bills first and living below your means. My rich dad taught me to focus on passive income and spend time acquiring the assets that provided passive or long-term residual income. Both dads served as strong mentors for me as I grew up. The fact that I chose to follow the financial advice of my rich dad did not lessen the impact that my educated but poor dad had on me as well. I would not be who I am today without the strong influence of both these men. Step 6. Make disappointment your strength. Be prepared to be disappointed. Rich dad often said, only fools expect everything to go the way they want. Expecting to be disappointed is a way of mentally and emotionally preparing yourself to be ready for surprises that you may not want. By being emotionally prepared, you can act with calm and dignity when things do not go your way. If you're calm, you can think better. Try new things and expect disappointment, but always have a mentor standing by to coach you through the experience. And be kind to yourself. We all make mistakes. We all feel upset and disappointed when things do not go our way. Yet the difference lies in how we internally process that disappointment. Tell the truth. The future belongs to those who can change with the times and use personal disappointments as building blocks for the future. The key to this step is to take action. Reading, watching, and listening are all crucial to your education, but you must also start doing. Step 7. The Power of Faith Even though you may not be good at everything, take time developing what you need to learn and your world will change rapidly. Never run from what you know you need to learn. Face your fears and doubts, and new worlds will open to you. Using these seven steps, my wife and I were able to move from being homeless to being financially free in a few short years. I trust they can assist you in charting your own course to financial freedom. To do that, you need to be true to yourself. If you are not yet a long-term investor, get yourself there as fast as you can. Sit down and take control of your spending habits. Minimize your debt and liabilities. Live within your means, and then increase your means. The reason I've introduced you to the cash flow quadrant is to offer you different glimpses into who you are, what your interests may be, 
and who you ultimately may become. Anyone can find his or her own unique path to the financial fast track, regardless of which quadrant they operate from. Yet it is up to you to find your own path. Remember, your boss's job is to give you a job. It's your job to make yourself rich. In the end, you must mind your own business. Once you make that commitment, life really does get easier and easier. Minding your business is not hard to do. It's just common sense. Believe in yourself and start today on your path to financial freedom.